Absolutely. All thanks. right. <clears throat> thanks, Scott. Sure. Um, thanks, Scott, and thanks, thanks everybody for uh, for meeting us on this beautiful sunny day. Um, it's uh, it's really good to have your involvement, your continued involvement as we work through this process. Um, you know, we're now in our 11th uh, long range facility planning meeting, and we've got a lot of really exciting things to share tonight. A lot of that uh, you guys have already um, you've seen uh, before this meeting, really kind of the, the bulk of it and um, all that material. So hopefully you've had a chance to, to look at it and, and kind of digest it a little bit, but we'll certainly go into much more in depth and explanation and, and why we shared that particular material uh, as we move along in the agenda. Um, so tonight we're, we're really, um, just like we always do, we're gonna open up with uh, just kind of our open discussion uh, really quickly, um, revisit our norms for this long range facility planning committee uh, meeting. Um, we're also uh, are gonna be joined by Lauren with Piper Sandler, uh, who has an updated uh, general obligation bond scenario. And Lauren's gonna join us around uh, 6.30 to present that. So um, that should be uh, really enlightening to get, a, get an understanding of what a you know, 60, 70, $80 million bond might look like uh, for you and, and for the for the taxpayers. Um, and then we're gonna look at that district-wide prioritized improvements, um, looking at not just the K-5s, K-8s, but also uh, the balance of the middle school, the gym that we're keeping, uh, and also the stadium in the high school as well. Uh, Lauren and I and, and team have done some um, pretty extensive work there as the direction of this committee from our last meeting. Um, and then after that, and we get, we get through that, the, the plan is to really kind of think from a high level uh, moving forward, what does a 20 year plan look like for Silver Falls School District? And, you know, I think it'll be really good for us to get kind of an understanding of what, what, is that, what does that entail? You know, what, what, what's, a, what's a priority um, for the district? not so much looking for kind of the, the nuts and bolts and, and things like that at this point or at this juncture. It's really almost like a guiding principle sort of development level. Um, so kind of think of that as another opportunity for an open discussion uh, because that's, that's gonna uh, hit at the tail end. And if we're doing good on time, we'll, we'll do that around 8.15 uh, tonight and, and give a good half hour for that. And then we'll circle back with the, uh, what did we learn uh, at the end? So um, I, with that, you know, maybe we just open it up for the open discussion right at the very beginning. Um, I might encourage everybody just for the sake of, of time and just to honor Lauren's time when, when, when Lauren comes on board here, um, that maybe we limit any 20 year discussions until we get to that part of the agenda. But, you know, any other kinds of thoughts that have been percolating or suggestions or concerns since our last meeting, uh, just like we've done before, I'll, I'll go around the room and just call on everybody. If you want to wait um, and, and give you kind of your thoughts and feedback at that 20 year juncture or even at just the very end, um, you know, feel free to do that um, and just say fast. I like to pass. So, um, Jonah, I'll go maybe and I could, Jonah, maybe I could jump in real quick just to mention a few things in case they come up during open discussion. We just get we could get those out of the way. Just some. Yeah. You know, logistical things and and uh, I just wanted to to let everybody know that you know we've been paying a close attention to the feedback that we've gotten through each meeting and one of the things we've heard loud and clear is 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 the importance of extending the process that that this process feels a little rushed to everyone so we will be extending this process uh, through the fall and one of the major reasons for that of course is that we will have, uh, new board members coming on board and we really want to make sure that they're engaged uh, and that they're up to speed on the work because we're going to have to take major ownership of this if we um, are, are hopeful that a, uh, we can get a bond on the ballot and then and then passed by our voters. So um, that's that's a really important piece. The other thing that we've heard loud and clear is that it's really important to the committee that we have a 10, 20 and 30 year plan. And so today we'll touch at the, on, at the end the 20 year plan and we do intend to address a 30 year as well. 
Um, and again, you know, your feedback is vital to this process to help us steer uh, uh, which way we go. So, um, <clears throat> so thank you for that. Hopefully this is the last time we have to meet virtually, although COVID cases are on the rise and, you know, um, and, and certainly we're paying attention to that, but it would be really great if we could get back to an in-person meeting as soon as possible, um, because we're gonna end this, I believe Jonah, the last meeting is in June, is that correct, or May? Um, originally planned for May, uh, and I guess that really kind of depends on the bandwidth of, of okay. the, yeah. the district and the committee. June and we're not planning, just so everybody knows, we're not planning on having a July meeting. The soonest it would be, would be late August. Uh, we'll start back up again. Uh, we're not gonna start, we're just gonna continue on with where we left off. Um, and so there's, there's plenty of time for that. Also, please be sure that you, at your convenience, peruse through the district website, uh, our tab there for long range facilities planning. Debbie's been working really hard uh, updating information and it's all in response to your feedback and the information that you've requested and all of that. So, uh, you know, we're, we're customer service minded and, and if there's a, some information you think everybody could benefit from, please, please let us know. Um, so having said that, Jonah, thanks for giving me an opportunity to mention those couple of things and I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just start at the top. Uh, Melissa, you're, you're first on the, on the list here. So my first last time too. Um, <laughs> I think so. I don't know why that is. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you. Getting the materials ahead of time was fantastic. Um, I had a chance to look at them and I really appreciated that. Uh, second, I'm really excited that we're going to be looking at 20s and, and 30 year plans. I think that's really important, especially, you know, looking at the information from Piper Sandler about the bonds, you know, yeah, they're 20, 30 years. So we need to make sure that we're doing this correctly. Um, and I think I'll probably save Anything else I want to say until the end, just to see where we go now that we kind of have a new vision. So, thank you. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Eliza. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sending information out to us ahead. Um, it helped me a lot. Um, I was kind of wondering if BLRB is going to be included in our extended long range facility planning. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I had a couple ideas just about the um, things that we were looking at and I was just thinking kind of about community messaging and probably it's stuff to talk about near the end, but it's kind of like just thinking that it looks like we're gonna be focusing on we have $95 million in needs and we're going to try to pass hopefully a $70 million bond looking at like the numbers we're dealing with here. And um, so I was thinking we can message out things like we're talking about uh, bringing all the roofs at every building and facility up to date. Um, and I also thought that maybe another way to sort of gain community connection, which it, this is listed as a priority two item would be like carpets, but it doesn't have to be carpets, but there's carpets and soft coverings <laughs> listed in there and they're only $277,000. I was just kind of trying to think of like lump things that are at every building that we could message out. That's all I'm trying to get at. Thank you. Great. Really appreciate that, Eliza. Um, and don't mean to interject, um, but I think that that community messaging is absolutely critical. Um, and I think um, just to, to clarify, yes, the need is absolutely that 90 million, but it, it's much larger if you really take the overall, that's the prioritized, the prioritized need, if you will, um, that we kind of boiled it down. Well, um, thank you for that. I was so. actually gonna ask about what pri how you determine priority, but I think that's gonna probably come later in this presentation, so. Thanks Absolutely. for clarifying Absolutely. that. Yeah, thank, thank you, Eliza. Uh, Lauren, did you want to say anything or just wait until your, your portion? Up to you? uh, I, I'm good. I just want to say I'm happy to be here. Great. Thank, thank you, you, Lauren. Uh, Ray. 
Um, yes, let's see. <clears throat> I think I have some that might be more appropriate later on, but anyway, I'll just comment that I, I think it's a good idea to extend the process um, uh, so that we can discuss items uh, further out in the future. And then the other comment that I would make now is, I think I made it maybe several meetings ago, but it's so easy to focus on the buildings and that's very natural, obviously, but I still want to, in my opinion, remind everybody that, that we need to uh, keep the educational um, focus, the curriculum, uh, in the mix as well. And so rather than having buildings drive, uh, I'll use the words education, I think it should be the other way around. So I know that's hard to do, but but I think we're, we're um, kind of losing sight in some cases about the educational component. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Josh. Yeah, um, very grateful that we did extend it. I think it's needed. I, I did feel like if we were trying to come up with a, a decent plan and, and essentially one more meeting, it wouldn't be done. I'm so grateful that Brett brought up, you know, meeting in person. I really would like to do that. Um, it's my personal opinion that having meetings over Zoom and recorded kind of stifles the conversation a little bit because I think we're all kind of probably watching what we're saying. And then we're missing the body language of the group when we're bringing up ideas. Um, oh, thank you for the list of all the people on the committee. That definitely did clear some stuff up. So thank you for providing that. I personally would like to meet over the summer. Um, I, I, I understand why some people would not want to with a long year, but I'm a little bit nervous of losing a little bit of traction. Um, I do kind of feel like if we're not meeting, I kind of feel like this group is being directed rather than just being let go to kind of figure out what this community needs. And I think being able to get together in person would also just allow a lot of good brainstorming for the committee to kind of just happen rather than having an agenda, just set a meeting up like, what do you guys think? And just kind of let it go from there. And then I was a little bit, I still am kind of baffled by the deferred maintenance stuff about how school budgets, not just ours, but across the districts of the state, across the country, when it comes to deferred maintenance and essentially how schools just don't have enough money to take care of their buildings. And especially with how funding's being changed in the state um, for where we thought we had money, now we don't because of, of some new things um, popping up different measures. That was another one that I'm trying to wrap my head around was how we take care of our buildings without needing a school bond to do it. So anyways, those are my thoughts and thank you. Great, thank you, Josh. Uh, Brett Milken, did you wanna add anything? I'm just excited to, to chat about the 20 year plan and start looking at that because we know things change in technology really quickly, but there, if we lay the groundwork now, we can try to future proof things as best as possible. So I think that's exciting. Great, thanks, Brett. Uh, Aaron Scott. I think I'm all good. Thank you, though. I'm sure I'll have lots Great. of Great, thank you, Aaron. I'm <laughs> perfect. Other Aaron. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get off mute there. Uh, yeah, number one, I just I'm, I really appreciate that we've extended this out a little bit. We just still have more to chew on and more to go through, and we're just not quite there yet. So to, to try to have to get something out in May um, always made me even a nervous a few meetings back, and I'm just glad to see that we extended in into um, into into the fall. Uh, uh, and and just um, I want to just echo kind of what Ray said too. I, I really appreciate that how it's not losing sight of the educational adequacies of many of our buildings and many of our communities, even though maybe the facilities may not be where we want them to be or in a di ideal spot. I think that, I think that comment was spot on. So thanks Ray for, for bringing that up. So thanks. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Brandon. Uh, 
Oh, you're on mute, Brandon. You're still on mute. <laughs> okay, sorry. There we go. Appreciate the info that I got sent out um, early. It was nice reviewing that beforehand. Um, extension is, I think, going to be helpful. And I would agree with, and I completely understand if people aren't comfortable with it, but I think in person would make a huge difference with, I don't know, just how you know, having different voices heard. Like, I know I don't talk a whole lot in these meetings. I get a lot out of them. And you kind of say what you want at the end. But yeah, if everybody's there, body language, like Josh was saying, all that, that'd be great. But that's all I got. Great. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, Tom. Well, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> thank you for having generated the committee list, I, that was very helpful. Um, and I, I kind of want to echo the idea that having meetings during the summer, I think would be acceptable. Maybe we could at least have a portion of the group who, who have an interest in doing so we go into the summer so we can maintain some momentum and actually perhaps do, develop a better uh, outcome in the end because that's we really I, we want to make the best educational opportunity for our kids um, I'd like to kind of mention that my when I looked at the agreement we had with BLRB um, one of the things that came out to me was that part of this it looked like it was to develop us uh, be able to get the awesome grant and we haven't been actually presenting to the board, I don't think, which is part of the rules for the awesome grant. Um, and I feel like if we had some specific people that kind of designated as leaders or who could help kind of collate stuff, that might be helpful for that. So just throwing that idea out. Great. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Colin. Um, I'll wait till the end. I don't have anything right now. Great. Thanks, Colin. Uh, Peter. Yeah, I didn't really have a, a lot of input I was going to give, but um, when you did say that we were going to take a pause over the summer, that um, is concerning because I, I don't think we have time to pause. Um, I know there's been a lot accomplished, but I feel in the long range planning process, um, we're in about the same spot we were a year ago. Uh, we've accomplished things in the very short term, but uh, we've got a long ways to go for a long range plan. So uh, maybe getting some, some leadership structure to the committee so we can break out into subgroups um, and then have someone reporting what's going on to kind of maybe have a little more unification would be good to, to maybe leave that over the summer. But that's about all I have, thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let's see here. Um, Alan. Hey, how's it going? I think I will pass okay. till the end. Great, thanks, Alan. Thank you. Um, Jason, did you want to add anything? No. Great, <laughs> thanks, Jason. Uh, Lisa. Um, I just want to thank Scott and Debbie for all their work on key, uh, getting the info out and keeping the web page well organized. Um, I know it's a lot with everything else on their plates. Great. I agree, Lisa. Um, let's see here. April. Um, I want to thank Debbie too, because I did hear that some of the older records she's having to like find by hand and scan into the system. And I'm sure this is super time consuming. So I think she's been really on the ball. Thank you for that. Um, otherwise, I, I'm good for now. Thank you. Great. Thanks, April. Uh, Wally. 
Yeah, I have nothing to add right now. Great, thanks, Wally. Um, Brett, I think you're last. Yeah, sorry, I'm driving home. Um, so I just want to say I, I think the extension's good. It'll give us some good time, and I'm looking forward to meeting in person if we can pull that off. So, but yeah, thanks for everybody's work. It feels it feels good to have a little pressure uh, let off, and for us to be able to meet more. Great, thank you, Brett. Did I miss anybody? Lori? Oh, yeah. Hello. Um, yes, I'm very happy uh, that we're going to be having some really good discussion with Mr. Stanley and also about what our bond possibilities can be. And uh, I look forward to the rich discussion ahead. And I'm also grateful that we are extending uh, this process. I believe it's much needed. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Lori. Great. Well, thanks everybody for, for that feedback. I think that's, um, there's obviously a very clear consensus that extending the process and, and looking uh, further beyond the 10 year plan is, is a very good thing. And I don't think that's a, a big surprise for sure. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, Scott, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that we're not, we're, it's not in stone not to meet in July. I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. Of course, I'll be uh, uh, in Silver Falls all summer long, and I'm more than happy to meet and continue this discussion. I think what we were trying to do is be respectful of everybody's uh, different schedules in July, and and uh, but we can continue talking about that, and, and I can certainly come back to the group with, with some different options. Uh, I know, uh, you know, Jonah and Richard would be open to, to talking about that too. And, and, um, but I just want to make sure that, that uh, I mentioned also that, that at least in my view of, of Silver Falls and the future of Silver Falls, this is absolutely the most important work that we have in front of us. Um, aside from what's in the immediate future of just getting kids back into a five day a week routine, um, because these decisions right here will last for generations. Uh, and we will remember these discussions forever uh, because we will see the impact of the decisions for years to come. So I just want you to know how much of a priority this is uh, for me and, and, um, and going forward. I think it's really exciting work to have a group this diverse and have discussions this rich as well. So um, again, keep in mind that it's not, um, it's not set in stone, not meeting in July. We just wanted to be respectful of everybody's uh, summer schedules. Uh, back to the, I want to mention something to put it in perspective, something Josh, uh, Josh brought up about deferred maintenance. Um, and, and of course, I come from a, came from a larger district, um, Beaverton. Beaverton's deferred maintenance for 10 years, the next 10 years, is $610 million. Uh, when they went out for a bond that I think was, uh, I think it was the largest in state history, uh, it was about 600 million, if I remember correctly, um, uh, that 10% of that amount is what it's going to cost them in deferred maintenance. So this is a very, very usual thing for a school district. I don't think you'll find a public school district anywhere that doesn't have millions of dollars in deferred maintenance. It's just one of those things. It's, it's, it's one, of the, one of the things of public education that is, is, uh, is truly wrong in terms of how we uh, publicly fund our, our schools as a country. So anyway, just wanted to mention that as well to put it in perspective. It's certainly not unique to Silver Falls at all. Um, but anyway, uh, just want to turn it back to you, Jonah. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, so uh, just really quickly, we'll go through these through the norms uh, like we do at the beginning of every meeting. Um, again, a lot of this, obviously, we have no issue with, and we always um, do really great on, on these opportunities to be respectful of others' ideas, opinions, and questions, uh, to be engaged and actively participate. Um, there are no bad ideas, but really what's important is that we all become ambassadors for the project that was mentioned uh, earlier, that that's really important. 
um, being open-minded and thinking outside the box. So, I mean, going from a 10 to 20 year plan is a perfect example of that. Um, that consensus decision-making in this, in this group is really important. Um, and just being a good and active listener, um, keep the needs of the students first and, and to raise point, thinking about that educational adequacy as we move through this process uh, is really, really vital to this work. And again, you know, just as a reminder, this this isn't a um, this isn't a a you know this is an advisory group. It's a long range facility planning group that's that's advisory to the school board, who will have the the final decision. So I think really extending the process past uh, having a new school board on on board uh, is is a very um, appropriate decision. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and then of course have fun. <laughs> Um, that consensus decision making is about honoring the input of each uh, member of the long range facility plan um, and about working together as a board committee so everyone on the committee really understands how those decisions were made and, and why um, and honoring all of the foundational work that's been done to date. So there's been a lot of really, really fantastic work before we came on board and during the time that we've spent this last year together that um, that has been compiled and, and vetted out. And so that's that's really good foundational work. Um, create a parking lot of ideas if you know as needed when they come up. Um, and then of course, you know, we don't really use this that often because we don't really need to. Um, but when we can't come to an agreement as a committee on unanim unanimous consensus, we'll place actionable items to a vote. 75% needed to break deadlock. And we usually just kind of use a simple majority for moving options forward just so we can move the work forward together as a group. Um, some of that foundational work, again, before we came on board was the long range uh, facility planning guiding principles to protect our community's investment in all of our Silver Falls School District schools to provide a safe and high quality learning environment for all students in all buildings and to spend our tax dollars as wisely as possible. When I mentioned earlier about what we're really looking for kind of as we brainstorm later today um, with that 20 year plan, th this is kind of the level I think that would really help uh, guide the decision making moving forward on really having a fruitful discussion on that 20 year plan. So um, that's kind of um, in a nutshell, you know, real high level, broad um, organizational structure, I'm sure Everybody's had a really um, thoughtful discussion on that um, and, and thoughts related to that. So I don't know if we have Lauren on board here. I know Lauren is going to give the presentation for for this. Um, I know she needs check really quick here and see if I've got any emails. Um, and we can come back to this uh, when Lauren comes on board. Um, let's see here. I'm just going to back out of here for one second. Jonah, I think she's here. She just needs to get um, into, she's listed as an attendee right now. Oh, OK. Um, Maddie, is that something we can help Lauren out with? Yeah, is Lauren, that's what I was wondering. Is Lauren supposed to be a committee member? She is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. She joined us a little bit late. All right. She's not on my list, so I brought her in now. Perfect. Thank you so much. Hi, Lauren. Hi, there I am. I was, <laughs> I had no way of letting you know I was here. I tried raising my hand, but <laughs> um, so thanks. Um, let me see if I can get set up here to share my screen. Oh, um, I can't share while you're sharing, Jonah. Okay, I will stop sharing here. Let's see here. I can guess. 
swear I've done this before. There we go. Let me see. Okay. Um, can you see? Let's see. Of course, this can't be easy. Oh. Well, can't find full screen when I want it, but can you see the levy rate analysis file? Okay. Absolutely. Yep. Sorry, can you see your faces? My Zoom is so weird. <laughs> I can see them both. <laughs> okay. Um, well, hi everyone. I'm <laughs> sorry for the uh, technical difficulties, but I'm Lauren McMillan. I'm with uh, Piper Sandler, and we serve as the district's uh, kind of financial consultant, uh, officially bond underwriter. Uh, and we've been working with the district for quite a few years now, uh, and most recently helped the district execute the refunding bonds last year. Um, so I can't remember if I spoke to you or if, I mean, I was definitely with uh, the board, I think a couple of weeks ago, just um, on a different subject on pension bonds, but obviously here tonight to talk about geo bonds. So um, we're going to get a little bit of background information just in kind of standard stuff that we look at when we prepare one of these analyses that's really kind of important when you start looking at these concepts. And then we'll look at some um, scenarios that we ran for the district. So one of the uh, important components in our analysis uh, is interest rates. So basically what we're doing is projecting out the potential levy rate cost over the whole life of the bonds. And so um, that could be, it's 20 years in this case, but also those bonds won't be issued for several years. Um, given the district is looking at, I think, now I can't remember, November 22 election, or there's a couple of possibilities at this point. Um, I don't believe we're looking to issue until um, calendar year 2023. So what that means is interest rates can change a lot between now and then. Um, and that's something that we need to factor into our analysis. This graph uh, shows uh, the index for tax exempt debt, AAA MMD. That is a index of naturally very high rated tax exempt debt and where it trades. And it's a barometer for where the tax exempt market is. Uh, and the district's bonds can be sold tax exempt. That means investors don't pay taxes on the interest income they receive. Therefore, they're willing to accept a lower interest rate. It's a benefit that's only extended to municipalities. Uh, the other line here is the 20 year US treasury bond. And so that's uh, a barometer for the taxable market. Uh, but what happens in treasuries oftentimes kind of uh, influences what's happening in other markets as well, though there can be some divergence when there's big market events like uh, the COVID uh, sort of shock, uh, which isn't even on this inset anymore. We've kind of passed that already, which is crazy. Um, but uh, there was kind of a spike in tax exempt rates uh, after COVID, whereas it, it didn't show in treasuries because investors flooded their money there uh, because they were very concerned as to what was gonna happen. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. And so money tends to go to treasuries, which folks view as safe. So again, one component in our analysis uh, and kind of a, a moving target. So what we do is include a cushion over current interest rates to account for potential increases between now and when the bonds are actually sold. Um, another big component is assessed value. So general obligation bonds are paid back through a tax levy on the district's property. And so um, what happens with that assessed value 
um, impacts the levy rate that um, folks pay for the bonds. So if the, um, you know, there can be very high growth, obviously that spreads the, the debt service of the bonds over a bigger base and can help lower that levy rate. Uh, you can see here in the far right column, the net AV growth, um, that the district's um, assessed value, AV, uh, has grown every single year in some amount. So we do factor in some amount of AV growth into the um, projections, but we don't wanna be too aggressive. If we include a higher growth rate than what is actually achieved in the future, which obviously we cannot know, uh, then the levy rate may be higher than what we're projecting. So we're fairly conservative in the assumptions that we use at this point. Um, the, again, the big number that's important here is the assessed value. Uh, that's what uh, bonds are levied on, and that's different from the real market value, which is an estimate of what the property is actually worth. And I apologize, uh, Superman is, um, uh, I don't know that you can see him. My four-year-old has made his way into the room. One second. Can you sit down, please? Okay, um, so assessed value. <laughs> this is disconnected from the real market value. It's just how Oregon's property tax system functions. So the real market value can grow a lot and for most Oregon jurisdictions has, but the assessed value is actually limited. So um, it's actually the assessed value of each individual property um, the annual growth is limited to 3% per year if the assessed value is below the real market value. So the assessed value can never go over that real market value for that property. Um, but you can see that in many years, the district actually grew more than that 3% number. And that's because um, you can grow the 3% for the existing properties, but then if you have new construction, that can put the district's total AV growth over that 3% mark. But it's also not a guaranteed 3% each year. You can see that there were some years where the district's growth was under that 3% mark back in the early um, 2010s when we were recovering from the recession. And that was very common for a lot of um, Oregon districts. The other thing at the bottom here um, is urban renewal. So there is an urban renewal area and, that the city operates and we just take that into account. Um, different urban renewal areas um, treat geo bond levies differently. And so we just wanna make sure that we're looking at that correctly and because it does factor into the levy rate. So uh, another thing that we need to look at is just what does the district outstanding bond picture look like? Um, if you have existing bonds, we can work new bonds around those. Uh, so the district does have two series of bonds outstanding in 2013. And then again, the refunding that we just completed last year. So in total, those issues are outstanding until 2027. Uh, debt capacity wise, uh, Oregon's debt capacity is actually very generous. Um, most issuers uh, don't get very close to their limit, which is actually somewhat surprising to me still. Uh, I started in Arizona, which has a very different system and a very high growth state and their legal debt capacity was much more limiting. So issuers were often bumping up against their legal capacity um, and some would issue bonds each year as their legal capacity grew with um, increasing values. So it's very nice that you don't have to worry about that here. So this next um, graph is a lot of numbers that I won't go over. Uh, it's basically the input for the next page, which just looks at the, the district's existing historical levy rate. Um, and then the projected levy rate for the bonds that are outstanding. You can see we have the annual debt service here for each series of bonds, uh, what the assessed value is. Um, and 
if our projection again is very conservative. We have factored in 3% for the first few years and then actually ratcheted it down to 2.75%. So really conservative. Um, we also factor in some amount of tax delinquencies and you can see the, the projected levy rate here. So it's easy, a little bit easier, I think, to see this with the graph. So the dark gray bars are the actual levy rates back to 2001. And you can see they're not really flat. And that's really just what we expect when we project out, as you'll see for the new scenarios, we project very nice, clean, flat looking bars, um, but it, that, it just doesn't happen that way since uh, AV growth, again, is a big component. And that's something that's set every single year. And it will never be exactly what we project it to be. So that's why the levy rate may um, bounce around a little bit. So again, we've got actual rates through 21 and then the projections on the existing bonds through 27. So this is very small, very small print, but uh, we'll go through the detail for each of these. This is a summary page of the six um, scenarios that we ran this time. This is not meant to be um, you know, a menu of exactly what you may order or come up with for your bond. Uh, it's just really a starting point. And I know that there were some numbers run previously and presented, I think, at a committee meeting maybe two years ago now, or maybe just early last year. Um, but, you know, things can obviously change. Uh, these were just the, the, num the amounts that were requested by the district, so they may not line up with the the numbers that you're seeing in the um, planning side of things. But we will eventually sort of come together um, and get on the same page. Kind of in the beginning, it's a lot of back and forth. You know, you'll see how much things may cost um, on the project side. But then my job is essentially to translate that into the levy rate side. So there's a bit of back and forth of how much does this cost? What would this look like? And what rate do we think voters will accept? Because that's the other fun thing. Since you're, you have so much room on your legal capacity, what really constrains you is what you think voters will actually approve um, for the levy rate. So makes it a little bit difficult at times when you're looking at doing an increase. So this, we basically ran three different amounts, 60 million, 70 million, 80 million for two different structures. So the one structure looks more like a step as we'll see in some of the graphs, um, it has a higher levy rate up front, 325 in each case. And then it drops to a lower rate at different points in time as we'll see. And the other structure is just a combined level levy rate um, factoring in those existing bonds uh, and keeping it level over time. Um, so I think I'm going to skip a lot of um, the detail here. It's a little bit easier to see as we go through the graphs. But in each case, we also just used a 20 year borrowing term as a place to start. Um, you can go longer or shorter. Of course, if you go, it's, it's like a mortgage. If you go shorter, that kind of increases your annual cost. Um, although you may have a lower total interest rate. If you extend it, um, you may be able to lower that annual cost, but it can come at a cost of a higher total interest cost. Uh, the, really the constraint here it, legally is that you cannot borrow for a longer period of time than the useful life of what you're financing. So if you're financing a lot of, you know, building upgrades and things in construction, it's not an issue. It's more like um, if you're, say, just borrowing and all you're doing is getting, say, um, you know, some computers or curriculum or something that has a much shorter useful life. But with a really large basket of projects and a lot of that being construction, it's usually not an issue. Sorry. Hey, Owen. Owen. So, um, 
other thing to note here, in each case, we've assumed a 2% cushion over current interest rates. Again, interest rates are really, really low right now. Uh, and we just don't know when they're gonna go up and how much they're gonna go up. So a lot could change between now and when the bonds are issued. And the other part I kind of skipped over was the assumption that all of these are issued in early 2023, which would assume a November 22 election. I think that's still a little bit in flux and you know, moving a little you know, six months here and there doesn't change the um, scenarios too much. So the first one that we ran, this is 60 million with that step structure. So you can see we have 325 up front. And the timing of the step was kind of something that I came up with for this one, <laughs> to be honest. So it is very flexible. Um, and we could have it have the levy rate drop when your existing bonds pay off. But I was thinking that going back to the voters four years later is pretty soon, and that may not be palatable to the district. So six seemed like a good place to start. Again, this is not set in stone. We can make changes here. And the other thing was to try and have a sizable step here. If we keep the longer we keep the levy rate high at 325, the bigger the drop becomes and vice versa. If we were to shorten it, the amount of the drop gets a little bit lower. So right now you're looking at a full 20 year amortization for this debt and it stays at 325 for the first six years. And then you would have another opportunity for, an, for a new bond, but this time it's kind of a different message where um, you can go out and say, hey, we have the opportunity to do more projects um, and issue more debt without increasing the existing levy rate. And so districts are, are trying to kind of factor this in to their structures and planning up front. Um, so they have these opportunities, uh, you know, but you may not wanna do that. You know, some districts, say, nope, I just want to get as much as I can now, and then I won't worry about issuing for the next 20 years. Or if I have to issue, I will raise the levy rate. Uh, it just seems that, you know, issuing without an increase in the levy rate can be an easier ask in most cases. So the next two pages are just the detail here for that levy rate graph. I'm not going to go over everything. Of course, I'm happy to answer questions if there is anything, but this just details all the assumptions for everything that went into that levy rate projection graph. And you can see the details here. So the 325 on the levy rate, again, wrapping around those existing bonds and the projected levy rate there. And then it drops from 325 to 153. And I wonder if I should just zoom in. I can't even see it. <laughs> um, so it gives you a really nice sizable drop here in the levy rate, um, which translates to a, a sizable amount that you could ask for in that future election at the existing rate. Um, again, the AV growth assumptions that we had talked about previously and tax collection assumptions. Um, There we go. And this is just the detail on the debt service. So the second scenario is 70 million. Again, similar structure here, except you can see that the, the time for that next issue is a couple years longer. So I think it's about eight years here at 325. Again, trying to make a sizable drop in that levy rate here. And the detail here, same story. Really all that's changing is this amount. We've gone up to 70 million and then the structure here, again, it goes from 325 to 169. So not exactly the same, but pretty close, um, pretty uh, similar sized drop here. 
and scenario three, looking familiar, slightly different, 80 million this time. We've left um, the levy rate at 325 for, like that's about 10 years. And you can see a drop. This is a little bit smaller drop. This time we go from 325 to 194. And so basically what you're doing is um, kind of a trade-off of getting more money up front, and then you have the higher interest cost back here and impacting your future capacity slightly, but still a very decent size drop uh, for an, a potential future issue. And again, the detail here. Now we're into the second structure. So back to the same amounts, starting with 60 million. This essentially looks at what you can essentially do a wrapped combined level levy. So what we've done is really minimize the um, bars here on the new issue in an attempt to keep it level over the entire 20 years. Um, the trade-off here is the interest cost is quite a bit larger. So we'll go back to that summary page once we've kind of um, eyeballed and absorbed these um, scenarios and kind of look at the trade-off there. But so the benefit is you're able to keep that levy rate lower. This may be a little more palatable for voters, potentially increase your, your chance of uh, approval, but it's at the cost of higher interest cost and you don't have that drop built in. So this is flat for the 20 years at a what is that? 213 levy rate. Okay. And then option two of this structure, so 70 million, again, combined level levy rate. Since we're looking at a larger amount, we've got to raise the levy rate a little bit. And now we're at 241. And finally, 80 million again at the, the combined level levy for a 269 rate over the life of the issue. And again, all of these are projections and estimates. Um, the debt service is locked in when bonds are sold. Um, but that levy rate is not set until each year when the assessor sets the new values. And basically, the district tells the county assessor how much they would like to levy for debt service. So that's basically the debt service you have due in the next year, maybe adjusted for some delinquencies, potentially balance that's built up in your debt service fund. And then the county assessor takes that amount and then divides it by the new assessed value and that spits out your levy rate. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the summary page and I'm just noticing that um, it looks like there's a chat now. Okay, so is the projected levy rate 210 per $1, 210 per thousand? Yes, so all the levy rates are basically in a rate per thousand dollars of assessed value. Hopefully that answered your question. Let me know if it didn't. Um, please explain again the reason for the sudden drop in levy after six, eight or 10 years. So that is by design, um, essentially planning ahead for a more sustainable bond program. And building in future opportunities for another geo bond without going for a levy rate increase as the district is now. Again, it's considered a little bit easier ask if you are able to ask voters for a new authorization without raising that levy rate. So it's some districts essentially bite the bullet, go for the larger increase now in order to set themselves up for kind of a more sustainable program where they can ask for more 
um, in a few years down the road. And that's because like, uh, I believe Jono was saying, you're not alone with the deferred maintenance. And you know, I don't know that the district's gonna be able to get through all of that in this bond. So you may need to come back in a few years and you could set yourself up for that opportunity now. Hey, Lauren, I have a quick question. And this has to do with like the current state of construction right now, how everything's basically doubled. So if we'll just play best case scenario, whatever bond we want, we pass. When we pass that bond, do we immediately have to cash that money in then? Or can we sit on that for a little bit to wait for, say, construction prices to possibly drop to a more suitable level? It's a great question. Um, you aren't, you don't have to issue the bonds right away. So basically there's kind of two parts there. You could decide to wait mm -hmm. on issuing the bonds. You don't have to sell it right away. The authorization that you get actually doesn't have an expiration date. So if you wanted to, you could sit on it. Uh, you could also split the difference and issue in more than one series. So um, you could do half of it now, uh, and then you could do another, the remaining half, say two or three years down the road. Some things to consider there is by waiting on the second half, you do take on interest rate risk. So risk that interest rates are gonna go up farther in that time period, uh, but also construction cost risk because while you maybe you get to the point where you can't wait anymore you don't want to wait anymore you need to get those um you know those improvements done and maybe costs haven't dropped by that point so it can be a little bit of a gamble but you could kind of um again issue the authorization in multiple sort of tranches and kind of split that risk. So you lock in your cost on a portion of it now, um, and then you're not paying interest on the whole the whole authorization from the beginning either. Um, and then kind of see how things play out over the next couple of years. The other consideration is there is um, a tax limitation. So remember, you get that tax exemption benefit on the interest rate, but there are some federal tax rules. Um, that come into play. And the um, federal government basically doesn't want you borrowing it and then sitting on it all and then potentially earning arbitrage, meaning you earn more um, on your investments. So the limitation is you have to have a reasonable expectation to spend 85% of what you borrow within three years. So you could issue half of it and you have to spend 85% of that when you borrow it. So, so just that half. Um, and then you could wait and do the other half three years from now. So it does depend on your construction schedule too. A lot of districts are just burning through this money. And so they can do a, a really big amount in three years or less. But if your construction schedule is a little more delayed, you may need to actually wait and issue a portion of it a little bit down the road. Okay. Lauren, I have a quick question for you too. I mean, yeah. maybe you can kind of chat with the group because I, you look at both different models, right? Between the, the upfront versus the, the level levy. Um, and, you know, is it better to go for a higher amount, say at that 80 million, right? On the level levy, which, if I'm looking at just as a straight taxpayer, not knowing what I know being on this committee and, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely less of a hit to my pocketbook going from 212 to 268. Mm -hmm. and, and then maybe do, can we, is it more advantageous to ask up front to the community for more money at the $80 million level rather than 60 versus going for like a 60 or 70 at the, the, the upfront kind of scenario, which has that big hit up front then drops dramatically after what, eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just trying to think, you know, is there better, is one scenario better than the other for certain situations or is it just basically, basically what, you, what we may deem or the board may deem palatable for the voters uh, on, the, on the bond? Exactly, that's what you guys get to wanted, help well, the board to ask, decide. <laughs> I kind of wanted to ask the same thing on what Aaron's saying is, 
how how often have you seen that? You know, how many districts have you seen that do it that way? Do do it which way? The level, the, the more the level level, yeah. Um, I, we have districts that have that honestly do both scenarios, and we have some districts that will get a thirty-year issue uh, at a level levy the whole time, and not plan to issue anything in that 30 year time period. You know, if they want to go out for another bond, then they're going to be looking at another tax rate increase. And that's because they've kind of figured out that's the levy rate that they think their voters are going to approve, usually. Obviously, it's harder to do this step structure because it requires a higher increase now. It's basically you're doing that for the benefit down the road. And we do have districts that have done that as well, uh, who have said, look, I think that this 325 level is sustainable. Uh, I'm not saying your voters do. I'm saying this is kind of their thought process, right? Like if, if you come to the conclusion that, you know, voters may approve the 325, you can kind of select the amount at that levy rate level. You could do the 80 million or you could even do more. You could soak up that 325 for the full 20 years. It's just then you're you're limiting the opportunity for a future issue without doing a levy rate increase. So it's kind of what are the district's future plans um, for additional projects? Are you going to need more money, you know, six, eight, ten years from now? you know, can you get by on the 80 million now? Or do you need more than that? So it's really, there's no right answer. Um, and there's no solution that works for every district. Um, it's a lot about trade offs, um, and a lot about what your needs are, and what you think voters can get on board with. Well, I, I guess my thought was, you know, we're, we're thinking in that 60 ish range, right? Um, uh, kind of where, you know, in that 60 plus range for, for what we've been all talking about it, you know, would it be more advantageous to go at a level rate? Yeah, we know it costs us more interest, but, but at the 80 million level, give us extra slush, you know, kind of funds to fund more of the projects on our list and yet not have a huge impact to the voters, you know, 212 to 268 in my mind, just, you know, because, because we all know the voters are going to look at it and say, okay, I'm paying, what am I paying per thousand? And what is it going to go to? Like, that's, that's, I think, unfortunately, that might be a simple way of people are going to look at it rather than like deferred interest costs over, you know, 20 years. Exactly. So, follow on that. Is there an average acceptable levy rate in Oregon for 4G districts or something, you know, uh, one no. of our, Advisors said it's two dollars per thousand to get something passed in Oregon, and it looks like we're talking about doubling that. That's in, I've never heard that. I mean, that may, may be more of a, a campaign data point, um, but it's really interesting. Um, I don't think there's there's a right solution. We do have some um, comparable levy rate data at the end of this packet that we can look at too. That helps districts um, kind of size up. Um, you know, compared to other districts. I mean, the other point here, kind of where we started the thinking was this 325. Why is this not um, going? Here we go. Um, my Zoom is just annoying. Apologies. <laughs> so the district's levy rate was essentially higher than that 325 rate. So mm -hmm. The thing is, you know, are, do people remember that far back? Probably not. <laughs> some well, do. That, that also some might don't. be where they were so angry about their bonds. You know, I'm seeing that kind of makes my instinct say we want to pay more interest longer, probably. But right. And you can also come in between here. You know, this is where we started, this was a suggestion, kind of what I was working out with um, Steve, the business manager, but it doesn't have to be 325. It could be a little bit lower than that. It could be 275, or you can do the, the full combined level levy. If you think that's what you need to get it passed, 
then absolutely. It's just about understanding the trade-offs and the cost here. So for the $60 million scenario, your interest cost um, in the stepped levy, essentially you're allowing yourself to pay more interest up front and you're not kind of deferring it off to the future. The total interest over the life of the issue is just over 32 million. And then if you decide to level it out over the life of the issue, you increase the total interest cost by about 10 million. Wow. So it, it is sizable. Um, and, you know, some jurisdictions look at that and say, oh, no, you know, they have the kind of the opposite reaction. Like, my voters are conservative. That will make them mad. Let's do the lower total cost scenario. So, again, it's there is no right answer. And that's why fo some folks will do wildly different structures than others, just because their voters, you know, have different priorities. And, you know, they have, you know, different projects and things that they need to get done. You know, I have a work with Dallas School District that is pretty adamant that, so sorry, that their um, voters really like a seven year maturity. So they limit themselves and they have seven year bonds that they do because that's just what they think their community really likes. And it's worked. They've had some um, several successful authorizations. So I would, I would this assume means going back to the though, voters right? more frequently. Sorry. There, there'll be a much lower level though. We're talking probably what, 10, 15 million maybe? -ish. Yeah, and that's the trade-off is they have to keep going back um, to get more. I think they their last authorization was maybe 20 some million. So it, there is a trade-off there. And actually, I'm if you still, want- I'm still, I'm still confused about the reducing the levy or the, yeah, the levy from let's say $3 to a dollar and a half. That means the district receives less money each year either, which means either they're not paying the bonds off as rapidly and therefore they're paying more interest. Or, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I still don't quite understand um, the, the flow of money that, and, uh, that results, that, that you would, how it works with that reduced levy, jumping, how, how does a district have the ability to um, jump from three dollars to a dollar and a half, or, or when you pay off bonds, isn't it like paying off a mortgage? Do you have a flat payment at a certain interest rate, or is, or is that what I'm missing? So this may help. If we look at the numbers here, basically we structure the payments. This is your payments on the new bonds, so they're a little bit lower while we're working around the existing bonds. But well, here's your how, do you, how, do you, how do you structure that? What gives you the authority or the ability to do that? When we go to sell the bonds, we say, here's how much the district wants to pay back this year. We say, we structure we, what's offered and what your debt service payment is. There's a lot of flexibility in how much you're paying back each year. And so we can move things around to adjust this total debt service number. So you can see the years that it's 325, the debt service is up in the seven to $8 million amount, but we actually cut it back. So your debt service that's due, that's covered by the levy goes down, creating that step. But if you build a new school for, pick a number, $45 million, don't you need the $45 million in the bank in the first two years? How can you spread this, the bond sales out over 20 years? You need the money right now. Oh, I'm sorry. You're not selling this amount each year. You're, you're selling the full amount, the $60 million, up front. So... This is structured, assuming that all the bonds, the, the whole authorization is sold right after the election. And that means the district would get the 60 million in the bank at that point. So that's like your, your mortgage when you buy a house. You get the money up front, and then you pay it back little by little each year. 
And so these are the annual payments that you make. That's the word, covered new, by bonds, the word new bonds then means a payment. Sorry, could you say that again? The, the, the heading in the column is new bonds. Are yes. you saying that's, that's a payment? Yes, this is the debt. So debt service is okay. the payment that you make on the bonds. Okay, so, so it's like your principal and your interest payment that you make to your lender. Okay, thank you. And, All right. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say there's the other detail here, and this will be available to everyone if even if it's if it's not already. I believe it was posted. It is. Um, by the district if you want to check out all the numbers and uh, all their detail. But this shows you the detail of the principal amount. So that's basically the amount that you've borrowed. You can see that this column here adds up to the $60 million number. And then the interest is over here. And so principal plus interest equals your total debt service. And that's what's paid to investors each year. And that's what's levied um, against the assessed value. Lauren, real quick, um, off the top of your head, throw a number out there with, for just what, what, what it was 120 million look like for maybe that flat line curve of that 268, we were talking about $2.68. What would what would that look like? Is that like would that stay at three and a half? You asked one twenty. I don't know one twenty off the top of my head. And believe you can't really do this stuff off the top of your head. I'm but just curious. Steve had well, hold on. Steve had mentioned um, that there was possibility of looking at a larger amount, but he had mentioned one thirty. So I do have one thirty in my back. Oh, that works. Right. Um, and one thirty for that combined if that level levy rate structure um, but a slightly different structure because if you're going that high you may also want to look at extending the term so again all the ones that we looked at here were for 20 years but you have the option to extend it to a 30-year borrowing and if you wanted to do that level levy rate structure you could keep the projected levy rate at three dollars and 13 cents so it's so three dollars and thirteen. So three thirteen for essentially, you know, 25, 30 years, correct? For thirty years, yes. Thank you. Yeah, for one hundred and thirty million. <clears throat> so one hundred and twenty, three ten, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I suspect, um, Lauren, that, and you probably don't know this off the top of your head, but um, that drop off back in 2013, that really coincided with a couple um, couple bond attempts from, from Silver Falls School District in 2014 and 15, is that right? Um, yeah. So I guess point being is I, I imagine um, that the thought being you know, we didn't want that drop to happen because then it's harder to go back out and ask for additional money. Um, so a lot of districts kind of see that as a lost opportunity if you don't level off you know, when that drop happens. Yeah, and well, I, the district did have a failed attempt. I, I need to refresh my memory here. Um, 2014, you thinking? It was 2013. 2013, yeah. Um, and I think there were also some issues, oh, I wanna say maybe with some unspent proceeds from the prior bond um, and, and maybe some levy stuff that kind of factored into uh, the narrative at that time. And that, and that was partly why the, the attempt was unsuccessful, but the district had tried to kind of fill in at that existing levy rate, I believe. I don't have the, of everything in front of me at the moment, but there was an attempt at that point. Lauren, last question for me. Uh, I'm trying to do an average taxpayer thing in my head. Do you have, I have the total assessed value for 2021. And then I'm gonna, is that based off of units like residential units? Cause I'm trying to get 
what is the average assessed value per property? I'm trying to figure out what the average cost per the citizen would be. Because some houses are 650,000, some are 200. Right, so, so you can, you'll have to check with the assessor to see what type of data they have available for the district. Sometimes they can provide you with like a median residential value um, that can be useful in communications. Um, otherwise, it can be easy to say kind of the tax burden per $100,000 of assessed value. And then that way it's easy for folks to scale. If they say, okay, well, my assessed value is 200,000. So it's twice that, kind of like that. And then Lauren, you said you had that comparative analysis with other districts. I saw that in the packet earlier. Is that something? Yeah, let's go there. Um, if I can get back on track here. This Zoom like hides half of my controls in PDF. So that's why I'm a little <laughs> wonky here. This has been extremely helpful, by the way. Oh, great. I'm glad. That's why we, that's why we do it. <laughs> so um, this is the tax burden for um, kind of neighboring school districts. And, you know, it's our title. Uh, pretty wide range here. Um, but we do have this information for all school districts in the state. So if there's somebody else that the district kind of tends to compare themselves with, we can also add that into the table. But uh, this is sorted based on the total tax rate burden. So, you know, it, the districts, all the school districts have a permanent rate. So that's for your operations. That doesn't change. Uh, that's kind of set in stone at this point. Um, and then, some districts here have a local option rate. Again, that is a voter approved levy. Um, usually I, I think all of those are five year operating levies. There is um, an option to get one for 10 years that can go towards capital. But the distinction between local option and uh, geo bonds, if you're familiar with Oregon's property tax system, local option is subject to this fun mm -hmm. uh, little, a uh, thing called compression, um, which your permanent rate is also subject to, meaning that it's a very, very complicated portion of our tax code, but or, uh, essentially some properties don't pay the full rate if it's reaching this compression limit. So you may not get the full levy rate on a local option, whereas you do on the bonds. There's no compression on the bonds because um, basically, investors need to have confidence that you're going to get what you love to pay them back. And we have that um, because there's no compression there. So that's why local option is less um, kind of sought after. It's a very complicated uh, sort of tax and just, again, five years for operations. But if you add up uh, all of their um, kind of total tax rate burden. You've got the highest here, Westland Wilsonville at just under $9.7 per thousand. And then you guys are down here in the middle at 6.63 per thousand. Again, that's total burden with your permanent rate and your bond rate. And the other information here is kind of, if you wanna to compare to similarly sized districts, you know, we have the ADMW information here. But then another um, factor to keep in mind is the assessed value. So, you know, $1 on Silver Falls AV is gonna raise a lot less than $1 on Salem Kaisers because they're basically, uh, how, I can't do math right now, it, 10 times your size. Um, so they're gonna get a lot more money even with a lower levy rate, but they actually have a higher levy rate. So they're just generating a lot of money off their property taxes in comparison to you because just due to the difference in the assessed value. So the Do other- you know, is, Was there some really unusual circumstance with Gladstone that they are so much above most of the rest of the, of the districts? 
they're, they were just successful in getting a really large bond to pass with a really large tax burden. They, their rate used to be upwards of $5 um, and it's come down to four. So for a long time, Gladstone and Hermiston were actually vying for the top bond rate in the state. And they've both since come down a bit, but they were, again, upwards of that $5. So, I mean, I thought that average levy rate um, of about two bucks was really interesting. Um, and you can see it's, maybe it does average out there. I don't know. Um, but, you know, some districts are successful in going higher. Uh, well, you know, some, not so much. So it's, there's not, again, a one size fits all. Um, I feel like a broken record. I'm saying a lot of the same things over and over, but, um, you know, we had uh, one district, I believe it was, uh, this happened more than once, but Corvallis uh, sticks out in my mind that they actually went out for a bond um, and I think without a lot of preparation, a lot and not a lot of input from the community and it failed. They came back very soon after with a larger amount and people were like, what, that's crazy. But it passed because they got input from their community um, that just the mix of projects the first time was not right. It wasn't what they wanted and what they really valued had a higher price tag, but it got more people on board. So um, definitely the levy rate and trying to figure out what's affordable is important, but also getting um, support for the projects can you know, get that authorization over that approval uh, sort of hurdle. Is it challenging to get a breakdown of these are tax basis. So we have timber, farm, industrial, and residential in our district. And the rates are, you know, the timber and farm are hugely modified over the residential or the uh, uh, actual real market value. But uh, it'd be nice to, is it difficult to get those numbers so we can get a sense of where our money's coming from? Um, I'm not sure. We'd have to ask what the county assessor um, is able to provide. Uh, and they, I'm thinking through the forums, they might, that might be on the 7A, sort of what the breakout is. They should have that. So how much of the district is, um, you know, forest, I think is the technical category, residential, commercial, industrial. The thing is, and I think it should, it should have the breakout of the real market value versus the assessed because they essentially, the levy rate is the same for the properties. The difference is that they get a lot of um, exemptions on their value. So they're like farmland has a lot of exemptions. So they're assessed value is much more reduced compared to a residential property. So um, we could see what's available from the assessor. If you yeah, I can chime in there. Um, I have the all that data from the assessor in my mapping program where I could show a map that has the, the ranges of the assessed values. It doesn't take any of those kind of discounts into account, but um, could at least be um, kind of that general, you know, these are the properties that are assessed between one and 200 and then a scaled range um, all the way up through that. Okay, yeah. Right. Very cool. Well, great. <clears throat> Thanks, Lauren. Uh, really, really informative. Really appreciate it. I, I don't know if there's any additional questions, um, but all this information is available and um, I like the bonus, the $130 million, <laughs> $130 million. Appreciate that. Um, is there any other questions for Lauren before we, before we move on? I think we got everything answered um, in the chat. Thank you, Aaron. Um, <laughs> sorry for uh, my acronyms, the ADMW. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's really helpful. OK. Great. Well, good luck, everyone. And of course, um, 
Steve has my information and you'll probably see additional things from me <laughs> at some point. Perfect. Have a great night. You too. All right, let's see here. Hey, Jonah, I know we need to stay on schedule, but do we have somebody from the city? Isn't uh, one of the guys from the city here about any of their upcoming plans to pass bonds as well? Because that's going to affect us as well, won't it? I think Jason's on, isn't he? Jason. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't really have any plans that I'm aware of to, to pass any bonds. Our um, Civic Center project, we're trying to finance with existing revenues, not, not finding new revenues. Was the water treatment plant uh, going to be a bond or also just water funds? Um, that we're still putting um, kind of financing plans together, um, but um, to my knowledge, that's um, not something that I, that I think we're currently looking at, but I'm not sure exactly on that one. Thank you. Great. Thanks, That's good news. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, last time we talked, we, we looked kind of at a high level at some potential opportunities for uh, the different sites, you know, the, really the K-5 and the K-8 at that time. And, and I got a lot of really great feedback from this committee. And really what we, what we learned was we really need to take a look at all of the costs, the deferred maintenance in addition to the program and work with the district to determine kind of a, a, you know, a prioritization, if you will, of, of the different schools and facilities. And so, um, so what we did is uh, Lauren and I and, and team just met and kind of w went through with a fine tooth comb, the facility assessment um, with an escalation added on to it um, and the, the projected development cost of 38%, just to kind of get a, a rough prioritization. And there's no perfect science to how we got to priority one, two, and three, except for we were really kind of looking at, um, if you remember at long range facility planning meeting eight, when we, when we voted on an option to look at, it was kind of 15% repairs at all the facilities Outside of the uh, outside of the middle school, which roughly equated to um, a little over that sixty million, including the awesome grant there. So the way we we kind of lined it up here, just as you're thinking about it and as we're going through this, is priority one is really sort of a base priority. So think of it as the sixty million dollar option. Um, it's it's a little bit more than that to be quite honest right now and how it adds up. And you'll see that when we when we move into that. The priority two is obviously the second priority um, and the second highest priority. And it's kind of a tack on. So it gets it gets you know over that 70 million. So it sort of roughly equates to there. But again, it's a little bit over uh, we couldn't quite get it into the 74 million with the awesome grant, but it's close. And then priority three is really kind of the 80. Um, 84. And so that kind of gives you a sort of a, a ballpark. And when, when we, when we worked on it, it was really kind of, you know, to, to Eliza's point earlier in the messaging and thinking about um, this, the highest priority really had to do with anything, water intrusion, infiltration into the buildings, um, you know, i.e. roof, uh, basements, flooding, things like that. Priority two roughly equated to ADA enhancements at the select sites. Um, and then priority three, for the most part, is um, kind of MEP and, and other systems. It doesn't always break off that way because we know that some schools have much higher needs than others as it relates to systems and water and things like that. So um, so this is, this is um, kind of, I'll just leave it at that. And maybe Lauren, if, if you can walk us through these. I think we, right now we budgeted about five minutes per school um, just so we can get through it in the agenda and get to the 20 year plan, but, um, and have some time for questions there. So um, Lauren, the first one we're looking at here is Butte Creek. If you wanted to maybe touch on that. Absolutely, and thank you, Jonah. Um, great job. Uh, so 
what we really were trying to do too is kind of simplify because the you know those of you that saw the actual whole facility assessment was it's a huge document um, and we were trying to get this down to something that you could look at with some of the priority projects <clears throat> and honestly one of the biggest needs in this district is roofing at a lot of the facilities so you'll see that basically uh, we have replaced single ply roof coverings uh, at Butte Creek and that's primarily over the uh, gymnasium and middle school building. We were able to put a new uh, single ply roof on the main building and a new Alaskan um, uh, AC shingle roof on the uh, cafeteria in the seismic upgrade. But we were not able to do anything with that, that building there. So um, one of the other projects here that's an, uh, a high priority is actually the gymnasium floor, which is an old uh, 3M tartan floor, uh, they use mercury in the process of making those. We have been monitoring that floor every year annually to make sure that it's not emitting any, any significant levels of mercury vapor, but it is something that we should have on the list and try to, try to get taken care of. To me, that would eventually be an issue that we, we don't wanna to get to. <clears throat> so- Can I just ask a quick question about that? You have two things listed there, like replace liquid applied floor finishes on gym and also abate the mercury gym flooring? That's correct. So, so you have to abate the existing and it has to be disposed of properly. And then um, you need to replace the, the floor. Okay, so the liquid would be replacing what you pull up. Yeah, and that's what they put down. That's not necessarily what the type of floor that we would put down there. It wouldn't necessarily be a liquid poured floor. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and then, un unfortunately, you know, as, as uh, Jonah shared, you know, we're trying to hit this, these target numbers of 64, 74, 84, and we were trying to get as close as we could, so we had those options. Um, so that ended up pushing a lot of the other stuff uh, into priority two. Um, so you've got some issues um, <clears throat> here, replacing some uh, siding and, you um, some aluminum and steel exterior windows. Um, basically, uh, the sanitary waste system is listed in priority two. Um, and a lot of that is some of the old lines underneath that feed into the um, septic system. Uh, so the HVAC system in that building, they're, they're newer furnaces, but this, this has funds to redo all the ducting. The way that it's currently ducted is, is not um, efficient and it's not working properly. So, and it's basically an old control system that, that we, can't, um, we can't maintain. So uh, we also have replacing some <clears throat> service equipment, um, commercial equipment in food service, uh, and replacing some uh, science institutional equipment that's also in there. Um, and then we have a little bit for re repairing of some pedestrian paving and uh, some storm sewer system. And then priority three, you get into uh, a little bit more uh, work on some masonry uh, walls, um, hollow metal interior doors, uh, resilient tile floor finishes, and uh, so some of those are in pretty bad shape, in particular in the middle school wing and their old, old asbestos tiles. So there'll be some abatement involved in those also. Um, <clears throat> laying ceiling tile, uh, some glued up ceiling tile. And these are some aesthetic things that you would touch on when you're doing other projects. So uh, replacing plumbing fixtures is also in there. Um, we still have a lot of old fixtures there. And some of these would be older fixtures that while uh, they're very low in lead. There, there could potentially still be some very low levels of lead. Uh, we just want to make everything, you know, safety first. <clears throat> so as you can see, basically, we're going for the warm, safe, and dry. Um, and we kind of put the dry first because if you're not dry, you're not going to be warm and you're not going to be safe. So, so that's why you see the roofing is prioritized. Right. So, and this is the second page here. So, um, and you have some, some, uh, <clears throat> some items here replacing uh, the 
electric wall heaters with air handling systems. So uh, that's in, I think, three classrooms. Um, and then priority two, there's a lot of priority two stuff and these are in the other category. Um, remodeling ex existing restrooms for accessibility. And there's a lot of accessibility items that you're gonna see that unfortunately got put into uh, priority two, but uh, trying to hit these target numbers, um, just wasn't enough, enough money for all the projects. So provide staff room at middle, middle school wing, pave existing gravel walking surface at sports field, um, provide ceiling and covered play area. There's a, there's a lot of items here. Um, see, refurbish existing storage building, provide uh, building signage, replace monument signs, replace add small building exhaust fans. I didn't actually realize all of this was had made it into priority two, um, Jonah, when, <laughs> when we went through this, but. Yeah. So uh, dishwasher replacement, et cetera. And so you can see you've got a subtotal down here, priority one of uh, almost 1.1 million, 1.4 million in priority two and uh, one, one point one almost in uh, priority three projects for the uh, Butte Creek. Right. So kind of roughly, you know, it, it would it would range, you know, from one million to all the way up to three point five if you kind of did the sixty versus eighty at Butte Creek. Again, rough numbers. There's no real correlation. You know, some things are higher, some things are lower. Um, and that's, that's kind of the sort of the magic. Now, full disclosure, Josh, we don't have anything for 130 million uh, just because that would be, I think that would be a different conversation um, at that point. But this is really in response to the direction from this committee um, from that, that eighth meeting. Um, did you want to kind of touch on Central Howl, Lauren? Sure. Is it Central Howl here? It is. Okay. So, Central Howell, priority one items. Um, and at that location, I have uh, HVAC being a, a, a high priority, uh, making some improvements. That, that's a pretty old system. It needs some duct work on the main building and the classroom building. Um, the fire alarm system is really, really old. We've had a lot of problems with it. Um, it needs to be replaced badly. Um, and... Uh, we have some water intrusion issues in the basement. So there's a sump pump down there, but the water comes in through the sidewalls and uh, also up through cracks in the floor. And um, it's, it's kind of a challenging situation. It's starting to degrade the, the sidewalls a little bit. Uh, so then you get into the priority two items uh, being replaced a, a carpet. Um, we have some areas in there that we were not able to replace carpet yet. Uh, Resilient tile floor finishes. We have uh, some asbestos tile still, uh, classroom wing that needs replaced, uh, glued up ceiling tile finishes. Um, that's just minor stuff, but you're gonna be touching it um, at the same time doing some of these other projects. Replacement of plumbing fixtures, um, replacement of the ADA uh, ramp that's currently uh, uh, outside of the classroom, the main classroom building and uh, remodel of the rear entry to provide ADA access, uh, provide platform lift. So that's another ADA issue because you have actually four different levels in that main building there. So uh, it's a little bit challenging, uh, not ADA at all. And uh, remodeling uh, restrooms to provide accessibility, that's actually a, a priority three, because that building does have two restrooms that are already ADA accessible that are on the main level. So, um, and then of course, um, <clears throat> we've got some uh, abatement in there for the vinyl flooring. Is that the whole spreadsheet there? So we've got 800? Yep, 800. for Central How. yep. Okay. Yeah, so it doesn't tell me what it is on my screen, so it makes it a little more challenging, but. Oh, <laughs> you see it here at the bottom, the bottom right, Lauren. Okay, I just can't see it behind the screen, but we're good. Okay, uh, Evergreen. This is Evergreen. okay. 
So Evergreen, um, Evergreen, we we put a new roof on the main building in 2016. So we're in pretty good shape there, with the exception of the classroom addition. So we do have some money to replace the single ply roof covering on the classroom addition. Um, and the, there's um, several wooden exterior doors, particularly the main front entry ones are some of the worst ones. So we have some high priority money there. Um, we've had to sand those several times because they start to hang up. Uh, <clears throat> and then we've got uh, some resilient uh, tile floor finishes. Uh, we've got some areas that really are getting to that point where they need to be taken care of. Um, and then we have uh, replacing ductwork and in-room radiant heat, modifying furnace ductwork and controls. So that's a pretty low number there, um, honestly, but um, I think between the two of them, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty small school. So then you get down to provide new below grade waterproofing, kindergarten wall. Um, so we've, we've had a lot of water intrusion coming in the wall uh, down there in the kindergarten classroom. And so that's a problem we need to take care of. Uh, there is a beam up on the stage that uh, is uh, sagging a bit. So it's to replace that sagging stage beam. And um, then you get into Priority two items, um, you have some, some siding, you have some exterior windows, um, placing metal uh, roof covering on the play area. We have had quite a few issues with leaks on that roof. Uh, it's pretty old. If we're going to keep that structure, then you know we need to look at that roof at some point in time here. Uh, replacing carpet, soft surface floor finishes, and really that, uh, that's there's there's several areas where that's the case um, the sheet floor finishes that's referring to the upstairs classrooms um, we have some really old sheet vinyl in those two upstairs classrooms um, <clears throat> minor player repair of glued up ceiling tile placement of plumbing fixtures um, and then a course an ADA uh, three-stop platform lift uh, actually it would only be two stops at Evergreen. The three stop would be Central Howell. So I think that got mixed up. So, and then uh, providing new ADA restrooms. Uh, anybody that's been there knows that the uh, restrooms, you have to go downstairs and then go upstairs to access. So um, they are not accessible. So provide a ramp to the, uh, to the library stage. Um, Pave existing gravel parking lot and abatement of the vinyl flooring in the upstairs uh, classrooms. Uh, priority three is the folding wall system there. We did a bunch of work on it in 2016 and were able to get it operable again, um, but at any time it could fail and, and uh, then we wouldn't be able to open that. And I think it's pretty important for some of the functions that they have there at Evergreen. So uh, I've got reploy, replace voice and data, and we put that in priority three. It's something that'd be nice to do if we look towards a global system, uh, uh, potentially in the future, voice over IP. Um, but at the current time, I think they're in pretty good shape. So that's why it's in priority three. Uh, fire alarm system. Um, there is a newer fire alarm system in that building, I believe. So um, that might actually be able to be moved to a lower priority. And so you have a total of 487,000 roughly um, in priority one, 630,000 priority two, and then approximately 106,000 priority three projects at Evergreen. So moving on to Mark Twain. Okay. Okay. So Mark Twain, one of the biggest issues is the roof system there. Um, we have a pretty hefty cost uh, for this, and this includes the embatement. We just basically tied that into this figure. You have a single ply roof over an old built up roof, and the old built up roof is asbestos containing. So, <clears throat> so it's a pretty significant project. We've had quite a few leaks, and we've been fighting leaks uh, at that roof for quite some time now. Um, also, uh, there's just a 
portion of the siding that actually would eventually need replaced, but this is an area that's really bad, that's priority one. Um, and that is on the uh, south side of the building. Um, replacing the fire alarm system is a very high priority. That's a very old 120 volt pull station system. It does not call the fire department or dispatch anybody. So those are, those are the big priorities um, that kind of eat up all the money at uh, Mark Twain. And then you get into priority two. So we have uh, a lot of windows in that building. They're old aluminum windows, single pane. So they, uh, they're in pretty bad shape and uh, the uh, glazing is falling out. So, um, and they're in pretty bad shape. So they need to be on, on the list in priority two. Uh, we have carpet, which is also in really bad shape uh, in the hallways and classrooms and needs to be replaced. Um, resilient tile floor finishes, still a lot of asbestos floor tile in that building. Some of it's in good shape, some of it is not. Um, and we have moderate repair to the wood sports flooring, which it really needs to be uh, sanded and redone um, to reflect the new school instead of the junior high school. So it's not, not so much of a critical maintenance need, I guess, but it really would be important for the school to get their identity, so. Um, okay, so where are we at here? Um, minor repair of glued up ceiling tile. We've had a lot of leaks, and so there's a lot of stained ceiling tile and damaged ceiling tile that need repaired. Placing the plumbing fixtures, um, a lot of really old fixtures there. Air handlers, mostly are unit ventilators in most of those classrooms. Um, we have some challenges when it gets really cold uh, with being able to bring in good good quality outside air because the damper system is outdated. It's really outdated controls. So, um, and so you have the controls and instrumentation and the balancing, et cetera, all tied into that. So, uh, voice and data system, we have a priority three. Um, replace parking lots and pedestrian paving, um, that's not really replacing the parking lots, but that's to uh, basically do some repairs in the bus drop-off area and uh, sidewalk area, and then uh, potentially some additional work up in front of the building. So <clears throat> then we have uh, really providing an ADA entry to the main entrance of that building. Uh, currently there is not one and you have to go down to the lower parking lot in order to gain access, go through the gym, use the lift uh, to get up to the, the main office area. Uh, stormwater pipe routing down to Mill Street. Um, we've had a lot of issues with the storm drain system. This is primarily dealing with the area by the uh, uh, locker rooms. It's, it's a second priority because what happens is when when that system plugs up and doesn't work, it actually floods through the locker rooms into the gymnasium. So that's, uh, that's definitely a problem. Um, remodel of the old locker rooms into proper uh, breakout spaces and sensory rooms. Right now, they've kind of been, we just, we just did the best we could with the space that was there for them, but they really need to remodel that space and make it more usable for, for their needs. So um, replace the exhaust, kitchen exhaust fans. Uh, one of them is really bad shape. Um, it might not make it this long, quite honestly, before we pass a bond. Um, but the other one we, were, we just recently replaced in the seismic project when we replaced the dishwasher. So uh, and there's some baseboard heaters in a couple locations that also need to be replaced. Um, and some electric wall, let's see. Uh, there's also some, some structural uh, items on here, just structural improvements that were listed uh, to improve the connections between the CMU walls and the wood framed uh, old locker rooms. So, and then you have some abatement down there for the sheet vinyl flooring uh, in the cafeteria uh, stage, actually, excuse me. So, so a quick question. Mm -hmm. 
has any of this been reconfigured now with them going K5? Like, are we ready to say now that if they're going to be K5 with bigger kids doing PE, that we don't need the bathrooms down connected to the gym and some of those things? Um, I, I think we have sufficient restrooms there um, without having to utilize those other restrooms. I mean, they haven't been using them, but no, I, I honestly couldn't tell you that. That would be, that would be a question for, for Greg. It just seems like taking away bathrooms is something that we shouldn't be doing at schools. You know, I mean, the closest bathroom to that one, you know, if the kids are in the gym for PE, they're going to have to go clear up the hall by the office to go to the bathroom if we take away bathrooms by the gym. So I'm just curious, like these are things that might be changing now with, with the reconfiguration. Well, they have the K, K-1-2s right now, so they have the littler kids, which would be more challenging to have to go further, I would think, um, to, to the restroom, and they, and they haven't had any issues, uh, to the best of my knowledge, anyway. So, I guess I'm just saying, I, again, we're, like, we're not, I guess, I don't know, it just seems like t taking a bathroom that's already existing and reforming into a classroom is not what we should be trying to accomplish in the long term. Okay. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I understand. And we just put this together. These are just, you know, we're looking from the 5,000 foot level. We don't really know for sure. Um, I'm sure they're going to have needs that come up when, when this change takes place. And we'll try to address those probably sooner than, than the bond, um, you know, would happen. Yeah. If that, if that makes sense. So. But as you can see, again, pretty quickly, you know, the, the priority one eats up uh, a lot of money really quickly and just just really roofing um, and fire alarm system. And uh, you got $2 million there pretty quickly. So priority two, 2.66, uh, priority three, 1.4. Yeah, uh, moving on to Pratum. Okay. So Pratum, uh, we've got some moderate repair of the basement walls and there's, there's a few areas there because we have water intrusion on the west side of the building is pretty significant. Um, uh, so that's a priority one issue. Um, we have replacing the fire alarm and I actually reduced this number quite a bit because when they did the gym addition, they put a new fire alarm panel in the gym. And this is basically just making, making it to where we tie the rest of the old original building into that panel. Right now you have two systems and they just don't really talk to each other properly, uh, if that makes sense. And so, um, so then you have additional um, funds down here for once again, addressing that uh, basement water intrusion issue. And uh, the other item in here is the uh, $10,000 uh, Remove URM chimney and replace with sheet metal. Um, so I thought I had um, I thought I had roofing in here also with that because the plan was to do the chimney with the roofing because when the time you do the roofing you'll you'll demo the chimney out and take it below grade and then basically roof over it if that makes sense which is what we did at Evergreen when we did the roof there. Right. So, so Lauren, are you thinking that that item five moves to priority one or that item 20 moves to priority two? Um, I guess that would have to move priority two. We, I think we, we moved the roof over there. Yeah, let's see. Yep. It would have to move to priority two one way or the other. That would be done at the same time at the roof. So, yep. mm -hmm. <clears throat> And that's on the, the main building we're talking about there. Um, hey, and then there's, they've got some additional funds for providing a, a perimeter sealant here the building. And I, I want to explain to you, you know, this is kind of a clunky system. It was really challenging for us to work with the system that the state put together that we had to use for the TAP grant. So it makes it a little challenging to to piece these all together. And uh, Jonah was really great in helping to take a lot of these little pieces where we could, and we tried to tie them into one single project and number to simplify it for people. So, 
A question. Um, I believe I've heard you talk about being kind of a dream that you would have uh, built up ropes on some of the built stools as prolonging their lives and reducing the work of maintenance. Just curious, what would the difference in cost be for this school to do that? For a uh, built up roof? Um, well, the main building is, is asphalt shingled. So the main building is just a matter of, of redoing the shingles. Um, the gymnasium building still does have a single ply roof system on it. And so, and that is on the list um, to, to replace, um, should be listed here somewhere. 22 for 105,000. Okay. okay. Yeah, so and Tom, your question is, what's the difference between doing that single ply and a built up on, on that? Yes. Yeah, or do you mean replace it as is or change it to the roof you prefer? We would probably, that's to replace it to, uh, with a built up roof. So we, the single ply roofing systems, we would try to replace with a built up roof. So a lot of them will involve in abatement so you'll remove the single ply, you'll remove the old roof, and then you'll start with, with a new roof system. Um, in some cases, it might involve tapered insulation, et cetera. And I actually have a roofing guy because some of these numbers were a little bit skewed that I have, uh, he's, he's going to work on trying to get us actual better estimates for each of these buildings um, that will hopefully be, yeah. They'll either confirm that these estimates are accurate or they'll give us better numbers to work with. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question with that. If you're doing multiple buildings, do you get like bulk discounts? You know, I mean. Um, not really. And a lot of that is just kind of the, depends on the market. Um, you know, of course, roofing is like anything else. It's really cheap to try and do a roof in the winter, <laughs> but you can't do a roof in the winter. You know, so summertime roofing is, is right now, I can tell you, it's really hard. We've got a coating project uh, that we've budgeted for, for this summer that we're already trying to bid right now to get somebody on, on board uh, beforehand. So, um, <clears throat> so yes, that, that is uh, the intent though, is to put a, a better quality roofing system on any of the flat roofs in particular. So. Um, so um, you can kind of see we're along the same thing. We have some, some accessibility items that have been moved into priority two. Um, and, um, and then we have some other items in priority three. Um, so we're looking at a total of about 400,000 for priority one, 600,000 priority two and 269,000 priority three. Right. And then looking at Robert Frost here real quick. Lauren. Okay. So Robert Frost, you have replacement of single ply roof coverings and metal roof, and you have the abatement issue too uh, under the uh, single ply roof, which was put up over the built up roof. Um, ideally, you'd like to do these at the, at the same time because we have a lot of leak issues because of the way they put on the single ply roof, they actually created issues the way they terminated where the metal roof uh, and the, and the uh, single ply roof come together. Um, so ideally, we want to replace all of this at the same time. You'll get a much better system and less problems with that. <clears throat> so... And then the heating system over there is all still original. Um, the controls are a pneumatic control system. Um, there's really nobody around hardly that knows how to work on those. So um, it's, it's a little bit challenging when we do have problems, we have to, we have to figure it out and get it squared away. Right now it's, it's all functioning, but all the air handlers are up in the attic spaces. Uh, so, they're, they're at the age two where when parts start to go bad, in some cases, you might have to have them manufactured um, because you can't just get the parts for them. 
so, so that's basically the, the two big ticket items that we have at Robert Frost for one point, almost 1.8 million. So uh, and then you have priority two items. Um, we do have some, some uh, siding issues, exterior walls, um, some areas uh, that need to be taken care of. Um, the carpet is in really bad shape in all of the classrooms. We did get the uh, hallways replaced uh, in that building and it made quite a difference, uh, but the classrooms uh, are in pretty bad shape. Resi uh, replace resilient sheet floor finishes. Uh, we have a little bit here and there, but we also have the gymnasium, which also is an asbestos containing sheet vinyl and it's getting older and we're starting to have a few issues here and there. The seams are separating, et cetera. And we've been trying to reseal those seams every year, it seems like during the summer uh, to just to try and keep it going. And um, where are we at here? Okay. Um, so we have some money in here for replacing plumbing fixtures. Uh, uh, the boilers themselves are actually kind of separate. So I put those into, into uh, category two or priority two because they could be done afterwards if, ne if needed. Um, and uh, the electrical distribution system. One of the problems we have over there is we have lots of big power, but so we have 483 volt, uh, three, three phase power all over the place up in the attic, but we do not have much for 120 volt. So if you need to put in an outlet, you actually have to install a transformer uh, in order to get that power transformed down. So. Um, <clears throat> And then you've got uh, the voice and data system. So they're pretty much in need of an intercom and uh, telephone system, um, major pair of clock and intercom. Actually, so the, excuse me, the place of voice and the data is actually voice over IP phone system. I thought we had moved that actually to priority three, um, but it is still in two. Lauren, that would be priority too because um, Robert Frost has a very one, probably the oldest phone system in our district, and they frequently have problems with it. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Brett. Now I remember that in our discussion. So, clock and intercom um, and the fire alarm system. Um, pedestrian paving, front sidewalks are actually in pretty bad shape. So, we're starting to get some, some, uh, problems with them falling apart. And um, the other item we have down here is to replace the existing folding partition walls. There's a sound issue you can hear between the classrooms. And so the idea is to uh, basically frame those in and try to create more, more of a soundproof barrier so that they have learning environments that you know are more functional. So, um, Disappearing stairs, is, is, it's a small item, but uh, it's basically the stair systems that get into the attic space and the mechanical spaces. They're all old wood units um, and uh, they're starting to get in pretty bad shape and need to be replaced so that we can access those spaces. <clears throat> and uh, the other item here you have is a uh, main entry accessible ramp. So currently there's a parking spot over by the cafeteria and that's where uh, people need to park if they want to access the main building and come around the building to get into the front. And then we have abatement for the uh, gym uh, floor. Priority three, got some, some uh, repair of, minor repair of uh, masonry, veneer, exterior walls, uh, which is basically resealing the building. And uh, some handrails on the ramps and um, interior and exterior, and um, that's it. Looks like we've got uh, on this, we've got that abate vinyl flooring in both categories. Yeah, I couldn't remember if we split it in half, but that wouldn't make any sense, Lauren. So yeah. you want that in two or three? Well, it would go with the replacement. So I think we got that in two because of its shape and condition. Question? On the... Uh... Question. Replacing the carpet. Is there any cost benefit 
to not replacing with carpet and going to a, a you know, like I know the kids up there have to eat in the classrooms and there's a lot of food that's spilled. Um, so is that cost in there just to strictly replace carpet or is it to also switch it to like a new vinyl flooring? No, that's to replace it with carpeting. So that's, that's what they did, you know, and this assessment was like for like, that doesn't mean that, that uh, decisions couldn't be made to make changes within that budget um, when we get to that point. And that's typically what you'd see happen. Yeah. Just out of curiosity off the top of your head, do you know, is it, is it comparable or is it a lot more expensive to go the other way? Well, it depends on what you do. Um, if you, if you go with, I mean, the cheapest flooring is, is, uh, you know, vinyl tile, but it's also the most expensive and most challenging to maintain. And it's not very environmentally friendly to maintain quite honestly. Right. Um, so ideally the best floor out there, if we were doing new construction and I had my way would be polished concrete because it's very minimal maintenance. You have limited chemical usage. It, it's almost nothing. Um, and it's just a matter of keeping it clean. So, so if there's concrete underneath that, could you rip the cut tile or the carpet out and just finish the concrete that's underneath it? That is a possibility. It is pretty expensive, but it also depends on, on the condition of that slab underneath. Typically in new construction, they know that they're going to do polished concrete. And so there are special things that they do when they pour the slab. Correct. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really know until you pull it, it up. It doesn't mean it can't be done because honestly, we did it in one of the high school classrooms uh, that had an epoxy finish, but it had a water leak. And we pretty much didn't have any other choice but to, to pull that epoxy off and, and polish it down. But it was kind of on the expensive side, to be quite honest. Yeah. Question, question, when you talk about replacing voice data system, uh, is that a, uh, a hardwired, like a telephone system, or are we using uh, wireless some, but I'm not suggesting Alexa, but a, a wireless system um, using maybe existing internet tech technology? It, it would be a wired voice over IP system where we try to standardize across the district rather than having distinctive systems at each and every school. Um, what's happened throughout the years is systems will fail and then a, quick, a school has an emergency, oh, went and bought one, but it doesn't really adhere to any standard because, you know, as everybody knows, we're still trying to become a school district rather than a district of schools. So it would be a, a goal of standardizing across the district with a system that we could all use. Um, we could all call each other effectively from any school and as well as tie into a standardized paging system and intercom, which would be very, very nice because those are all very disparate throughout the district as well. Right. Okay, yeah, thank you, Brett. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Brett. Uh, so Scott's Mills. Okay, so Scott's Mills, um, you've got uh, replacement of roofing again. Um, you have uh, replacing furnaces. That building there has some of the oldest furnaces uh, in the district. There's still, I believe, five, uh, six uh, oil burning, excuse me, oil burning furnaces. We've actually had a lot of problems with the, uh, the lines for those and uh, had a lot of issues keeping them running. Um, currently, they're all running good, but that is a high priority. So, um, and then um, just some additional exhaust fans. And I'm not, I wasn't privy to this, but I believe there was some discussion uh, in some of the rooms um, due to curriculum that they might be using some chemicals um, that require additional exhaust fans and something um, I'm going to be looking into uh, uh, and then a makeup air handling unit to add additional uh, fresh air. So, and then you have uh, a bait built up roofing, which is going to be found underneath the single ply roofing. So, so there's your, your priority one projects for Scott's Mills. Um, place the clock and intercom is priority two. Fire alarm and detection, priority two. Replace restroom accessory stalls, priority two. Um, model staff public restroom 
to provide uh, accessibility. I believe that's the uh, office restroom. <clears throat> so, and uh, providing drainage in the play fields. Uh, currently, if it rains hard, they, uh, <laughs> they get pretty uh, wet out there. So, and then uh, there's a project here to enclose the exterior walkways and, and uh, kind of refinish the exterior to actually make internal hallways. So, and I think that's something that that school could really use. Mm -hmm. So, and then remodeling existing restrooms for accessibility, ADA route from building sidewalks to playgrounds, um, and uh, <clears throat> abatement of, of uh, vinyl flooring, which is uh, vinyl tile flooring. So, and then priority three is a bunch of siding, basically, that building we've been kind of chipping away at, but there's still a lot of siding that needs replaced uh, on that building, and uh, windows would happen at the same time. So, those are all in the priority three area, um, replacement of uh, resilient tile floor finishes, and then you have a replacement of phone and data system as a priority three, as Brett shared, voice over IP system. And uh, that's that's it. Hey, Lauren, I have a quick question. Okay. Uh, that's the third school now I've seen where we're replacing a metal roof. Are they, okay. Did we use some cheap metal that's already rusted out or why are we replacing metal roof? I mean, like you drive by Robert Frost and I can see they might need a paint job, but are our metal roofs leaking? I mean, I understand the warranty might be up, but uh, didn't we choose a metal roof to last longer than a three tab or what am I missing here? Well, honestly, I don't have the specs on, on a lot of that roofing. A lot of it is, is original. Um, I could tell you that we have had leaks. Yes. Uh, Robert Frost, we have issues, um, in multiple locations where we've had leaks. Um, and so, you know, metal roof is only as good as, as how it's installed and how it's put together. And there are a lot of issues, uh, with, with that system. Um, as, as an example. So, and once again, you know, you, you have termination up there where you have metal roof that comes down and it's, it's uh, uh, tied in with the uh, single ply or built up roofing. And so they did a lot of damage to some of that metal when they peeled it up to try and get the other roof in underneath and terminate it. Does that, does that make any sense, hopefully? I, yeah, I see what you're saying. I just, it kind of floors me that we're replacing metal roofing, but. Um, and okay. it's some, some of these areas, honestly, I'm going to give you an example, like out of Scott's Mills, they, they cut holes in the roof and then, and then they, 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 instead of flashing it when they installed it, it's got caulking. And so up in areas that you have to get up and recalk um, frequently. So, Yeah. It just was, some of this stuff was just not installed right at the time it was installed. You know, I, I don't know, I wasn't there, but I'm going to say as cheaply as possible in some cases. Yeah. Yeah, no, I understand. I just, I seen it at, I think it was Evergreen, Robert Frost, Scott's Mills, and now what'd you bring up? Silvercrest all have replaced metal roofing. So I was just curious because that's almost a half a million dollars between those four. Right. right. Yeah. I know. I mean, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of metal roofing on there, and we see it here too at Silvercrest as well in priority two, right? Yes. And I did move it at Silvercrest over to priority two because I think some of that was in in a little bit better shape. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. so built up roofing in priority one. Yes. But that's uh so uh yeah and that's going to be separate buildings uh so to, so they're not like yeah working together I guess <clears throat> they're not transitioning from one to the other right right so um so where are we at here I'm sorry uh, Silvercrest the main building okay so um you have replaced built up roof covering. Um, we have some uh, uh, floor tile and sheet vinyl in that building that's really, really old stuff. And so that's what that is, is priority one. Um, 
uh, replacement of plumbing fixtures, replacement of ductwork, um, replacement of the fire alarm detection system. And uh, really that's some upgrades. I reduced that number some because we just put a new panel in. So it's really a matter of upgrading a lot of the devices that go with that. So, um, and then um, the pedestrian paving up there that Unfortunately, because of all the snow and ice that they get up there, there ends up being a lot of the icer and the, the paving is starting to degrade significantly because of that. So uh, priority two, we have the metal roofs, uh, the major repair to clock intercom system, um, placement of restroom accessory stalls, uh, replace all existing wood stair ramps, uh, provide platform lift to the basement for ADA access. Um, we have a furnace room that's full of asbestos transite paneling. Um, it's basically on the walls. It's, it's not that it's a hazard as it currently is, but it makes it really challenging when you need to do things down in that room. Uh, so, and then, uh, this has a number in here for remodeling the main office in order to be able to provide an ADA restroom. And I think the reason that is, is because the existing student restrooms in the main building are so small that it wouldn't be possible to remodel those and make them ADA accessible. So the idea was to add one and remodel the office. If that makes sense. And then we have some abatement in there for uh, vinyl flooring and some concrete work uh, to the retaining wall to stair for the basement. So, and then in priority three, we have the replace, replace voice data system. We're moving over to the 1970 classroom building. Okay, so the 1970 classroom building, this is a, this is a challenging one. You've got some priorities here, but this building really, um, you know, um, Really, that's one that we probably should look at and potentially look at um, replacing um, the building. So that's an old barn structure. Um, we can't have uh, a students in that if, if we have any significant snowfall currently, we have to leave that building vacant. So, but based on this list, um, we tried to make some priorities for it. Um, major repair of wood construction and repair, place asphalt shingle roof coverings. And part of this is some structural work to improve that. So replace the carpet, soft surface finishes, um, major repair of clock and intercom system, replace fire alarm detection. So they broke this one up and it's all broken up into the separate building. So it's, yeah. it's kind of a little bit harder to follow. <clears throat> What would, what would it cost to completely replace that classroom? Well, that's actually two classrooms and the library that's in that building. So yeah. they, it's the it's like the band room, and then they it was a computer room in between, and then the library. Yeah, I think we um, Tom. I think we kind of roughly said at three fifty a square foot. It was it was just shy of two million. Um, but 350 is pretty low. So it's, it's, it's between two and three, probably, if you're just to replace like for like. And then depending on where you, where you put it, if you replace it in place or, or thought about a better placement for it, um, that might be something else to consider. That may drive the cost a little bit. Fair enough. So, and, and there might be enough funds in here replacing roof structure. We've got $190,000 and it could be that there's enough funds in here between those, those dollars to try and uh, seismically and structurally, um, uh, you know, make the necessary repairs to it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you look at kind of our last, um, the last time we met, we, we showed a couple different options and those were just really like, you know, understanding that that was probably a really high priority that if we were to look at some kind of program element at Silvercrest, that probably would be it. Um, so that just showed a couple different placements, but didn't go much further than that. Um, so, and then um, we have replacing ductwork uh, in, in there uh, and should be, and heating system um, as a priority also. 
um, priority two, priority three, replacing carpet, soft surface floor finishes, and uh, place voice data system. And so what they did here, you'll, you're going to kind of see the same items in each of the different buildings, which would tally up for the total system. So uh, 75 classroom building. Um, I believe that's the West classroom addition. So uh, replacing a resilient tile floor finishes. Um, the tile in, in, the, in those rooms is starting to cup and buckle. Um, and uh, the, the sheet flooring is also a high priority in, in those classrooms as far as replacement. Uh, replacement of plumbing fixtures, um, ductwork, fire alarm system, and uh, the concrete stairs, which are starting to deteriorate. We put some really nice stair treads, aluminum stair treads on those, um, but you know they, they're only gonna last so long uh, holding into that concrete. Uh, and then abatement of existing vinyl flooring also. <clears throat> So uh, replace framed. Uh, so we've got exterior uh, siding replacement, exterior window replacement, um, the wood doors on that structure, uh, replacing those also in exterior. Uh, and then major repair to clock intercom system and uh, replacing wood stairs and ramps as priority two items. And then uh, I have uh, priority three, again, replace voice data system. So it's pretty consistent. And then the gymnasium building, replace wood exterior windows, uh, replace metal roof coverings. There's actually some areas that appear to be rusted, rusting out around mechanical units or starting to, I should say. So that's why that metal roofing is in there. Um, the replace wood sports flooring, um, we modified that amount. Uh, the flooring system up there is actually like a rolled out cork. And we put floor finish on it to try and protect it, but it's really, really soft. And where the bleachers roll out on it, it's basically torn up pretty bad. And uh, uh, it's just too soft of a material. So that's to basically go over the top of that floor with a wood floor. And that's what that pricing reflects. Uh, replacement of plumbing fixtures. Uh, replacing the ductwork and furnace systems and uh, clock and intercom, of course, fire alarm system. Uh, and those are your, your priority two items. So, or excuse me, priority one items. And then priority two, uh, we have uh, the wall carpet in the gymnasium, which is coming loose in multiple areas. We model existing restrooms to provide accessibility and modifying door thresholds to provide accessibility. And then, of course, priority three, again, major repair of clock and intercom system. Yeah. So you have a total of about 925,000 for priority one. Sorry about that, Jonah. Oh, yeah. That, all right. 721,000 priority two and 123,000 uh, looks like priority three, three. Yeah. for Silvercrest. And Victor Point. All right, Victor Point, um, one thing uh, you will see is there's only a small amount of money here for roofing, and that is for the kitchen. <laughs> uh, the kitchen is the only area that we have not replaced the roof up there. So the uh, main building had a new roof put on it in 2015, and then in 2017, I believe, we did the, the gymnasium. Um, so that building should be good for roofing with the exception of this one area for another 40 years. Yeah. Um, so, and then um, we have replacing some ductwork in that building, priority one, uh, fire alarm uh, and detection system. It's once again, it's an old 120 volt system. It doesn't really go anywhere, call anybody. It just evacuates the building. Um, and uh, makeup air handling unit for the HVAC work. Um, and increasing parking. So that's one of their biggest requests up there, I think, is, is the need for additional parking. When they have any kind of event, uh, there is no place to park. So uh, those are priority one items. Priority two, um, placing exterior aluminum windows and steel windows. Um, 
We have uh, some rooms uh, that have in-room radiant units, uh, it says here. So replacement of restroom accessories and stalls. So that would be upgrading the restrooms, trying to make them more accessible. Um, uh, south restrooms, making them uh, accessible, replacing partitions, et cetera. Um, and ADA bench and locker rooms, more accessible items, I guess, and adding additional exhaust fans needed in storage rooms. Priority three, carpet. Um, basically, that's in the in the one main hallway, uh, I believe. And uh, resilient sheet floor finishes, and uh, replacing plumbing fixtures, voice and data system and re-slope floor in the south quarter to meet requirements for uh, side slope landings and handrails. So that's an, that's an ADA issue actually there, so. Great. Um, so fairly small uh, dollars at Victor Points, just in a little better condition overall. Um, 319, 286, 156 mm -hmm. there. Um, at the middle school, this is one that we didn't really budget for when we did our, our analysis kind of a few meetings ago, um, but there is a need at the gym building that we're keeping. Um, so you want to go through that really quick, Lauren? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, uh, the doors on that building, uh, a lot of them are really, really old and they need replaced. So we have replaced aluminum and steel exterior doors and hollow metal exterior doors. Um, Excuse me. Um, we have once again a single ply roof covering that's over a built up roof on that building, uh, asbestos containing. So you have a significant uh, amount of money to replace that roof. Uh, and uh, the abatement is, is listed down below. And those are your priority one, like really going to have to do items. Um, priority two is to replace domestic water distribution, which is also a significant problem. The underground uh, old galvanized water lines that feed that portion of the building are rusting out pretty badly. And every time we have to shut down the water and then we reestablish pressure, um, giant chunks of rust break loose and they clog all of the fixtures. So every time we have to shut down the water, we have to go through pretty much every plumbing fixture in that building, take it apart, clean out the big chunks of rust. Um, sooner or later, that's gonna lead to a leak and we're gonna, we're gonna have to do it. So that's, that's why that's prioritized that way. So, and then we went to the interior doors, a little bit less priority, hollow metal interior doors, priority three, um, ceramic tile wall finishes, uh, that would be in the locker rooms primarily. So replace uh, carpet, there is some areas that have some carpet, uh, carpeted area in the gym that was put in. Um, uh, soft surface floor finishes, resilient tile floor finishes, um, and that's all those items that are in that gym building. There's a classroom, etc., cetera, um, that are all in the priority three. And so we kind of moved a lot of that stuff over into priority three. Um, the elevator being replacement, it's a really old elevator. We have had some challenges, um, but it is still functioning. So hopefully it'll be good to go. If this is just an auxiliary building, you know, and it doesn't have heavy use, we might, might not need to replace it. Um, but a lot of the plumbing fixtures uh, will also need replaced in that building also. And uh, <clears throat> the furnace right now, there is no, the, the original furnace has worked off the boilers. And so you had uh, um, air handling units that basically have been just abandoned in, in the gymnasium in the mechanical spaces. And they put in gas uh, unit ventilators, and those are fine until you want to get airflow. So if you have any kind of event or high occupancy, you turn on the exhaust fan, and then you have no heat. Um, basically, it just sucks the heat right out. So they're insufficient currently, and so that's why that's on there. And uh, moderate repair of electrical service and distribution. Well, that the main distribution electrical room is in that area of the building. It's kind of in, it's kind of in the old 1938 halfway and partially in the, uh, the gym addition building. So it's kind of half and half. So there's gonna be some, some dollars necessary to deal with that. 
Yeah, so a big chunk of that went to priority three, just because there's obviously going to be the biggest improvements at the middle school site, but really handling the 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 real needs in that priority one for seven seven hundred sixty thousand two hundred thirty, and then one million for priority three. These next two should go pretty quick here. Stadium again, we didn't we hadn't budgeted for stadium improvements in that. Um, in that initial analysis. So you'll see a little bit of a bump because of that as well. Um, but if you wanna go through that really quick, Lauren. Yeah, um, and basically we're just talking about painting the structure. Um, that's that's what you have some dollars in there is painting the structures. Um, we have some money that to replace the uh, wood frame press box and upgrade that. Um, and then uh, to patch the concrete slab at the tennis courts and repaint, which we've talked about as being you know, potentially redoing that tennis court and possibly covering it, but this was on the list in in this part of the assessment, so we we put that in there in a priority three. So, so you have a little over twenty eight thousand priority two and and uh, two hundred twenty five thousand priority three. Uh, and then the high school um, as well. Again, being the newest building, um, looking at those being priority three there. Yeah, and you know, um, we just basically based on, on dollars and stuff, um, we kind of push some of this stuff back. Uh, the, the standalone chiller is at the end of its life cycle. Um, the HVAC controls, we, there's a lot of those components that we can no longer get on that HVAC control system. So that's why that's on the list. And it is a pretty significant project. We actually were trying to get that done and tied in with the energy efficiency project that we did, but there was just no way we could make it work. Um, so that's why those are on the list. And uh, and then minor repair of roadways and stuff. It's just basically maintaining what's there. Um, I had hoped to repair a few damaged areas and seal coat and restripe the whole parking lot, but we just didn't have the money in general fund budget budget to do it. And so that is something that's coming and uh, those those prices reflect that. So, um, and then the you, other, I'm sorry, the controls in the CTE building is the other item that's tied in there. I was just wondering if you would need to also upgrade the, the, the data and voice system for the high school. Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, that should be on the list for both the high school and the middle school and our district office, though we're not talking about that at the moment. But yeah, those are all three are out of date systems that do need to be replaced. Would the middle school, that would probably be included in the cost of the middle school rebuild for the, the district. Go ahead, Jonah, sorry. Oh, for the most part, it wouldn't be in the, the gym would have to be, we, we'd have to work in the gym and, and add a cost there. But yeah, and then the district office, we, do, we don't have the district office currently. Um, and that's something that we should look at as well, obviously. So um, let's. I was wondering about that. Is the district office the last other building that we would be considering or concerning ourselves with as long range facility planning committee? Yeah. I think so. What do you think, Lauren? And it, it does have some needs. It's got the same roof as the middle school, but it's a little bit newer, I believe. So, uh, because that was a later addition. So, but it still does have a single ply roof over a built up asbestos roof. Um, but, you know, they did remodel that whole inside. So you have less, in, you don't have any issues on the interior of that building. Um, it's just really the roof is the biggest thing, I think, on that, on that structure. Yeah. Um, so just really quickly here, uh, so we can kind of get into this 20 year discussion and we'll, we'll be quick about that. I think we'll consolidate our, um, you know, what did we learn today in the 20 year? Again, this is very high level at this point. Um, but priority one, two, three, like we said earlier, roughly equated to the 64, 74, 84, you could see that it's gone over, uh, you know, and, and that was just based really on needs. And so, there's, there's some, you know, we could potentially look at wrangling that in, but as an opportunity um, there, but that kind of, that kind of gives you a, a sense of just using that criteria um, to, to look district wide, 
uh, what, what the needs are. As you can see, as I mentioned earlier, we hadn't really budgeted anything for the, the middle school outside of um, the replacement uh, there, and then also the, the, the stadium. So that kind of sets it off a little bit um, there, but we, we got pretty close in priority one to the target uh, repair costs overall uh, for the most part. Um, so that's, that's kind of where that's at at the moment. Um, general, general question. Yeah. If, if, uh, ADA has been around for like 30 years and it looked like most of your ADA issues were in priority two, which means we're somewhat negligent, I guess, in that regard. So how have we managed to survive, uh, for 30 years without, um, um, issues and and i guess then you ray uh, to be honest with you ray luck yeah go ahead pure luck, pure luck 100 percent luck yeah. and that is just like that <laughs> thank you that's not funny isn't it yeah yeah no i mean that's i mean again that's that's every district you know that has those challenges and and every time you come up with a, you know, either a replacement or a modernization, that's one of the one of the first things that you address um, in, in that. But at, to to Lauren's point, you know, if if you know if you can't stay dry, you know, everything else is kind of you know a little bit more of a challenge. Um, so that kind of roughly equates to that. You know, we were thinking about potentially pulling this just to get a sense for for what you guys um, and, and gals thought as far as um, a bond scenario, but there's just a lot of information that probably need to digest in preparation. Maybe we do that at the next meeting. And then again, that $130 million um, you know, question kind of raised some, some items and questions there. Um, so I, I, again, I think we should consolidate this to honor everybody's time um, and, and maybe go around the room um, to, to kind of just from everybody's perspective, what they're looking for in a 20 year plan. But before we get there, I just want to share with you um, one example of, of a 20 year plan that we, we had done for um, a district up north, up in Washington. And these are some of the items that go into a 20 year plan. Um, so I, I just wanted to share this as, as a frame of reference. So when you um, are thinking about what do I, you know, what should we see when what's right for Silver Falls School District? You know, these can be some factors that that play in there. A lot of times you want to, um, obviously you project out to the 20 years and in our case, 30 years, but you want to think about that kind of that bond cycle um, and when you potentially might want to, you know, ask this, you know, ask the community for another bond. So whether you do that um, you know, the SAC bond or the wraparounds, I think that's something to, to consider and to, to debate and to think about. Um, obviously, you want to think about all the facilities and, and where they fall in regards to educational adequacy and, and facility assessments and, and all the things that we've explored over the last year. Um, you want to think about those, those items. You also want to think about when these long range facility plans are updated. As we've mentioned before, um, this is a living document. So even, even if we project out 20 to 30 years, it will, you know, we will come and revisit it. And a lot of districts revisit it every two to six years. Uh, in Washington uh, state, you know, they get a study and survey and, and a long range facility planning, you know, dollars every six years. So they want to see you kind of on a six year cycle there. So that's what you kind of see with this, this green bar um, here. You kind of see this, this pink bar that really demonstrates when bonds are being retired um, for that particular district. Um, you could see, you know, a potential um, possible middle school bond debt here, you know, when, when they project it out. And it gets, you know, quite candidly, it gets a little challenging, you know, when you get further than the 10 years and it gets a little fuzzy, but, you know, we've got really great minds here and a really great group that I think we can fill that in. And come up with something that's that's you know even better than this kind of bond planning um, scenario, this this long range scenario. So that's just a real quick snapshot. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be what Silver Falls does, but that kind of gives a sense for a roadmap. Um, 
And then of course you've got the annual budget for, for facilities and, and, you know, how those get improved and, you know, all the great work that Lauren would do for your, for your district. Um, the other thing to take into consideration that we haven't really talked about yet, um, and that we sent this on earlier, is this, you know, notion of a, what we're calling a facility aging matrix. And what that, what that really looks at is what's the aggregate age of each facility and how does that relate to the district uh, in, in whole? And then what does that look like? moving forward into the 10 year cycle. So as an example, if it was the right solution for Silver Falls School District to look at a 10 year bond cycle, um, that kind of gives you a barometer for, you know, how old those facilities are. Now, some have older facilities that in newer facilities that bring that aggregate age up. So it's not a perfect science by any by any measure, but it kind of gives you a sense for um, starting at the top, Pratham being the oldest, um, you know, if you aggregated those ages um, and Central Hal being right there as well. Um, then of course the middle school. Um, and again, not a perfect science, you know, a, a kitchen addition at Silverton Middle School, it's comparably small square footage, you know, to a Schlater building, but, but um, it, it just gives a sense for kind of an average age over the years. Um, Butte Creek, Evergreen, um, uh, Silvercrest, you know, Silvercrest has a lot of additions and buildings uh, that kind of really um, change the dynamic of that aggregate age there. Uh, Robert Frost, um, Mark Twain, and then Scott's Mills is actually com comparatively new um, relative to most of the district. But obviously the, the, the newest one that we all know is Silverton High School. And Victor Point is, is you know, kind of sort of right behind that, but not my, it's 30 years past that um, in that aggregate age. When we, when we look at this, you know, it's kind of good to get a barometer of where district-wide, if you took the whole inventory and, and kind of where does it fall, you know, the district-wide we fall sort of between Mark Twain and Scott's Mills um, from an aggregate age standpoint. And really there's no magic to these colors that they're, they really correspond to just zero to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75. And then, um, you know, the 75 to hundred is kind of that red zone. So you could see um, coming up here, you know, in the next 20 years, you've got um, really as it stands now, four facilities that fall within that red zone. Does that make some sense? You know, it's, and this is just one part of the equation. So there, obviously there's many other factors, but this, this kind of gives a sense for what do we look like? So again, you know, if, if, if it was the right solution for Silver Falls to go for a bond in 2022 or 2023, you know, you're looking at an aggregate age of 50 years. You know, if you do a 10 year cycle, then that kind of jumps up and you see um, how those all compare. So I guess one thing I'd, I'd ask the group to do between now and the next meeting is to validate that those numbers are correct. You know, Ray and Wally have helped me out on, on some of them that, that um, you know, we were challenged with. Um, so if there's any other ones, you know, we wanna make sure we get this right. Um, that, that data is a little sparse. Um, in, in finding that. So, um, but with that, um, that's kind of a lot of information today and, uh, a, you know, not really much decision making, if you will. The, the plan and the hope is at the next meeting, we're doing it in person. And we actually had a, a, a pretty robust small group exercise plan for this meeting. Um, but it just, it, you know, we weren't able to accomplish that. So hopefully we could do it at the next meeting where we'll explore, um, you know, together in, in different groups in, in an interactive way, what a 20 year plan might look like for Silver Falls School District. But I might just go around the room and just ask, you know, you know any thoughts from today? Um, what does a 20 year plan look like for you? And, and you know, if, if you have a thought on, you know, a bond scenario that, that you thought was was more preferable in your sense, um, you know, feel free to share that as well.
So I'll just go around the room again. Good. Um, I just wanted to comment on your building age table. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking, you know, it's the age is sort of an interesting perspective, and I, I understand where that comes from. It's, it makes a lot of sense at some level. But BBNL had a kind of a compilation of what built structures needed the no, most money put into them. And um, if you could put a table attached to this PowerPoint that would that we could post uh, on the site, that would be very helpful. So we could sort of see how that compares to the timeline that you just showed us for uh, building age. Gotcha, no, that's a good, that's a good uh, point there, uh, Tom. And we, we do have that information and it is broken out per building. So it should correspond to that. And we can, can see. I ask a question too. Uh, it just doesn't seem like if you have like say Pratum where your main building where your kids are in classrooms and the bathrooms and most of that stuff is 1928. Yeah. You have a gym that was built in 1997 and just had major upgrades done to it in 2019. Averages the age out to 60. You still have a 1928 year old building. So that doesn't seem like that really works when you're talking. I mean, if you're talking about the whole campus, I guess you could say that. But when you're talking about buildings that need attention, that doesn't seem like that adds up the right way. Right. And it's kind of how you how you want to look at it, Colin. It's, you know, we have the dates for those individual buildings. And so it would use the same, the same formula, if you will, um, to, to kind of uh, look at that. So it's really just about, you know, you have buildings that have multiple additions and different vintages and some are, some are, you know, in good shape and some are, you know, not in the greatest shape. So it's not a perfect science, you know, just as the educational adequacy is not a perfect science or the facility assessment. It's, it's really the whole, you know, when you, when you look at it as a whole, you know, in, in the capacity as well. So that's a good, good comment there, Colin. Um, so I'll start with you, Melissa, because you are, you are, you are at the top of my, <laughs> at top left, so. I, I think you're lying, Jonah, because <laughs> my people move around when they talk, and I haven't talked in a while, so I feel yeah. like you're lying. <laughs> I swear, you really are. <laughs> um, okay. Um, well, one thing that I really think we need to think about is I went through and I totaled up everything on the priorities list that was ADA or accessibility. And because to me, yes, I, roofs are very important, <laughs> but we have a district policy that all students belong and that includes students with disabilities. And I think that we are just waiting for a lawsuit to happen. Um, I really think we need to prioritize ADA improvements. And so the total is, just shy of $1.5 million. So <laughs> I feel like we need to, to think bigger than 60 million. I think we're gonna need to think bigger than that um, because I think that that's really <laughs> important that we do that. Um, some other thoughts, let's see. Um, I didn't hear it mentioned that we talked a lot at the last meeting about surveying in the community and I was wondering, we, yeah. we talked about, you know, what we could do over the summer. It seems to me like a small subgroup of us could get together, put a survey together and kind of work with that different scenarios and options that we could talk to the community about and really boil it down to numbers and, and what it's gonna cost them now and in the future, that sort of thing. Um, I think that's it for now, it was a lot of, information tonight so it's going to take a little while to process that but thank you for all of it yeah no i appreciate that melissa and that was actually um you know before we talked about meeting in the summer potentially that was kind of going to be one of my thoughts was does that make sense if if the district and the committee you know wants to do that survey that would be a good sort of time to do that and come back with that information in the fall potentially yeah and i would love to do that um, Ray. Yes. Um, 
Well, the the fifty million dollars, give or take, in priority one is um, kind of takes your breath away. Uh, and I see. Well, I've already already mentioned the ADA, but I I see replacement of siding, and I see replacement of roof you know, very commonly. And so, um, I, just as a point of interest to me, I I would be curious if is what the square feet of siding and square feet of roof that we currently have in these seven or eight buildings would compare to square feet of siding and roof in a single K-5 or K-8 uh, building that would hold 500 students. Uh, because I keep coming back to the $50 million priority one, and I believe we said we could replace uh, Silverton Middle School for 60. And so to me, um, that's, uh, that's um, uh, conundrum, that's a, that's a tough one. And I know early on the Nelson survey um, said, you know, that, uh, that new school out southwest of town someplace uh, is dead on arrival. Uh, but there, I think that sentiment existed when we went for the second bond at the high school. And we had uh, just a super duper committee uh, sell that second bond for the high school. And so I'm, I'm still of the opinion that with proper education and work, that um, a new 500, 500 student school is something that we need to seriously consider and look at. I don't think that should be set aside just because um, the impression is it's the bond is dead on arrival. I, I think there are lots of educational benefits and those people who tend to uh, not like that idea, I think can be convinced on the educational side. Now, it might not happen first time around, but you gotta keep trying those kinds of things. Uh, tell people this is why. So, uh, so I'm really looking forward to talking even some more. One, one other little comment. Um, we've we've all grow, grown up with and heard about um, a classroom of 25 or 30 kids and one teacher, and that's been the model of education. Uh, probably 95% of the places in the United States, maybe the world. I don't know, uh, but. I'm curious if there's some educational research out there that is addressing if whether or not there is a different and maybe better model of uh, providing education for any any number of kids. So uh, I know that's uh, that's not very concrete, but uh, that's something that I like to think about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ray. <clears throat> Uh, Eliza, what are your thoughts? Um, what does the 20 year plan look like or what are your thoughts from today? Or um, I have like three main subjects. The first one to piggyback on what Ray is saying, um, I agree. It, it comes to also with the question of whether we look at uh, how we look at these bonds, you know, um, if we were to do that kind where you pay more up front and then try and drop it uh, maybe that would be our intention is to, to, to think a little smaller right now and go for the middle school and some improvements and then try to run another bond later for a new farm school. You know, I mean, a school that so a lot of times this community has thought closing schools meant sending kids into town. And that is not what we would be discussing. So I think that it really takes rethinking ideas of how to provide a modern education space for people who still have a small school mind. You know, my, my kids went to school at Butte Creek. It's a 300 person school. It's a small school K through 12 or K through eight. Um, secondly, with his previous point at the beginning of the meeting about keeping students first, um, I don't see anything in any of these priorities that include outdoor covered play space. And I personally think that that really really helps schools. And thirdly, why do we have to wait until November of 2023 to run this bond? 
I don't understand. I've, I've tried to ask Steve at the last meeting, but I mean, I think we should be looking at trying to run this in May of 2022 or, or November of 2023. I mean, 2022. I mean, you know, the way that costs escalate, we need to get this stuff happening now. And we have a lot of motivation and energy right here. I'll be quiet now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eliza. Uh, Sean. Oh, um, tonight I'm of several minds. <laughs> um, so we looking at, at these numbers, I guess the biggest thing is we, we do want to show the community that we want to take care of, of our, our buildings. And I think if we can demonstrate um, clearly enough that we'll get enough people to understand the dollars that we're looking at in uh, priority one, two, and three, if that, that makes sense. We'll never convince all of them, right? We're playing a percentages game. You get right down to it. I mean, the last bond, my parents had competing signs in their front yard, okay? <laughs> it's just uh, some people that you are uh, um, convinced. Um, we'll still need to, um, as I said before, communicate to each of these communities how important they are to the entire fabric of, of Silver Falls School District. Um, that's gonna be another thing we have to look at. But I guess overall the way I'm, I'm feeling, we need to take care of these priority one, twos and threes and the middle school as soon as we can. And then we can really start thinking 20 years out in the future. That, that's just the way I'm, I'm feeling tonight, at least. Great. Thank you, Sean. Um, Brett Davison. Yeah, I, I, I concur with what Sean just said. And Eliza, I, I feel the same way about the timeline. I, I'm, I'm antsy to get going. Um, I, honestly, it's, it's always overwhelming to look at the major needs throughout the whole district. It's just, it's completely overwhelming the amount of stuff that we need to get done. And we we're gonna have to make some really tough decisions about what goes into it and what doesn't. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited just seeing that timeline, just uh, Jonah's example of that timeline. I, I think we would have a ton of fun uh, and, and debates and all sorts of stuff, getting a cool timeline sketched out not in stone, but just what are, what are things going to look like in 20 years and afterwards? And I think this group is a great group to do it. Um, and then I do want to give a shout out to Lauren Stanley too. I work with Lauren almost every day, mainly almost every day because um, of my building. Um, but he just the work he puts in and, the, and what he knows about the entire district is a great perspective to have. So appreciate you going through all that stuff, Lauren. Thank you, Brett. Great, thank you, Brett. Um, other Brett. So looking at 20 years, the thing I would stress that I think we're lacking in the district, and I think Lauren would agree, is standardization, right, of systems that, that can be standardized. Our voice, our phones, our access control, security, fire, all of that kind of stuff. And when looking at standardization, some things to look at is future proofing as much as possible. So one way to do that is non-proprietary stuff, stuff that doesn't get us locked into one vendor or one company that can service it, because that's really hurting our district right now. So for me, standardization. Great. <clears throat> That's a great perspective, Brad. Thank you. Um, other Aaron, Aaron Cope. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a couple of things. Um, uh, just uh, first of all, the 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 bond kind of uh, discussion we had, you know, midway through about the levies and what those look like. I think it got me excited. I think with the rest of them, that you know, there's this is something that we can do, and I think believe this is something that we can take. Whatever, whatever level we go at, we can take to the community. And I think we can get them excited just as much as we are at, at doing something, at moving, and we can get a bond to pass. Again, we're gonna have to do a little bit more chewing on what that's gonna look like and what level that's gonna be at, but I'm excited. And I do believe that 
that we can we can do that just seeing some of those rough numbers as as, as estimates. A couple of things I, I took away is I, I echo some statements uh, made earlier on. Just I, I think we need to go out to the K eight communities um, with some of the more aging facilities and and and, and again do some more surveys. Um, uh, you know the resistance to consolidation may have been in a different time or may not have been framed at different times, but uh, but I think we need to go out and ask them. We we again we can't necessarily from this committee or tell them that this is what you need, but we really truly need to ask them. So I'm, I'm in favor of doing more surveys out to our, to our more, uh, to our K communities to, to, to see uh, what their input would be. Um, I also, you know, echo Melissa and, and Eliza's comments that we're gonna need to do more. Um, you know, we have the keep them, keep everybody dry, keep everybody safe and keep everybody warm. But those, those ADA upgrades are, can give me some heartburn, you know, looking at th this could be a, a huge liability for our district. Um, so that tells me, I think we're gonna have to go bigger than 60 million. And um, I did a little bit of quick math just based on some of the, some of the figures we saw earlier on today and looking at, okay, what if we did um, go with the pie in the sky route, right? What if we went to that $120 million bond, right? Um, on a $320,000, $25,000 home, that would be $315 a year difference between what they're paying now and what they would be paying at that theoretical kind of $3 and 10, per, you know, 10 cents per hundred or per thousand dollar figure that we, we, we heard earlier. Again, just guesstimates, but, but looking at what that, uh, an individual would pay, we do have to consider that in the community Boy, you know, hundred. That, that's not a ton. That's not lifting mountains in my mind. Potentially, you know, going from three ten or from roughly two thirteen to three ten per per thousand. Um, that maybe we need to think bigger, um, because I think if we can help educate our community and sell our community on what this encompassing bond will do, um, I think we can make all the communities very very happy, much safer. Um, and, and really do some amazing things to, to really get us dialed in for the next 20 years. So um, that's my few thoughts. So appreciate it. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Josh. I don't think I, I could have been asked to follow up, to have somebody to follow up on that because I agree with everything he's saying. You know, at Victor Point, <clears throat> they have some significant ADA issues regarding their computer labs and just kind of sloping of the buildings and bathroom stuff that, you know, it would take a sizable amount of money to try to, to fix that. And, you know, they have been very fortunate and lucky to not have uh, any significant disability um, complaints at that school. Um, so I think in order to fix a lot of this stuff and really set us up down the road 20 years and get a good foundation to build upon, I think, we do have to think bigger. I think we really do put ourselves in a really bad spot for trying to go back for another bond in five or 10 years later. I think that's gonna be a lot to ask rather than just explain what we're trying to do up front, be clear, be honest. And that a lot of that goes through canvassing the community. I think we should have probably done this a month or two ago. I mean, maybe it's not a good time because of COVID. I do think, I'm a little confused as far as leadership of this committee, and this is nothing against Jonah at all, but the previous two, I had the packets here, the two previous committees, they had chairpersons. And so I felt like it was probably easier to get stuff done and quicker when we had an idea like who we could talk to and get things answered quickly. I feel like it's a lot to ask of admin right now with COVID and everything else going on, particularly for Scott trying to get the school district going, getting kids in school, but then asking us to try to get this stuff done too. Having somebody here locally in the district who can go down to the district office or can canvas a local community, I think it's a little tough to ask Jonah to try to come down here because he doesn't live here. So it's just a thought that I have because I really would like to start setting up some type of subcommittee or something where we can get together and then ask what kind of questions we're gonna ask. And this time as a committee come up with the questions we're gonna put out to the committee, not get surprised that what the questions were because none of us had an idea. 
So it would be nice if we can come up with those questions and how our plan is gonna be to talk to the community and then come back um, with a plan, I think would really set us up for success. Great, thank you, Josh. Um, Lauren, you didn't talk enough tonight, Lauren. Thank you. Um, I just want to tell you all how challenging it was really uh, when it came down to trying to put these into priority categories. Um, and John will probably tell you that, but you know, as I use the warm, safe, and dry, the, my first round through pretty much most everything was in priority one. Uh, obviously, that didn't work with with you know the numbers that we were looking at. So we really were trying to put these priorities and and set them towards that 60, 70, 84 million dollar um, bonds so that they kind of would fit. Um, but very challenging for sure. So, but I, I just want to thank you all, um, you know, once again for all your work on this. So. Great, thanks, uh, Aaron Scott. Um, I I'm not gonna lie, all the numbers and the bonds and all that kind of makes my head start getting a little foggy. Um, so that was a little bit much for me. But um, I do I do want to agree. I think it was Eliza that said it with a couple things. I am also, um think that we need to be moving a little bit quicker than 2022 or 2023. Uh, part of that honestly is selfishly. I've um, you know, paid a lot of property taxes and done a lot for the district and I'm being, crossing my fingers that maybe my fourth kid will get to do this, you know, to go to a middle school that's not full of a bunch of modulars. So I, I also feel like we need to get on that as soon as possible. Um, you know, I, I kind of like the idea for going for a little bit of a bigger bond. I'm not sure that I can really justify. And again, I don't really remember, you know, when we talk about the 120 or 130, like what that entailed. Off the top of my head, I kind of feel like I would have a really hard time justifying a bond that big with only one new building, um, because I feel like there's still, they're still going to leave some things on the table. You know, we're still going to be stuck when Robert Frost and Mark Twain are full, or we're still going to be stuck with, you know, some, some pretty old buildings. So I feel like that, that might make me nervous. Um, you know, especially with them saying some things now that I am going to teach at Robert Frost, you know, and the fact that there's not a cafeteria and now they're going to have six grades there and eating in the classroom is, I've been doing it for COVID and it's, it doesn't work with kindergartners. So, you know, things like that, um, I feel like might be a bigger issue now. But, um, and then I also really feel like when we're talking about a 20 year plan, um, you know, looking at that idea um, and surveying people and um, getting some opinions about, um, you know, how Eliza was talking about that, that, newer building, but for the kids that are still um, living out of town and want to do the K-8. But I think that also, I would like to see that at least on a, as a conversation for a 20-year plan. Um, it, it is really, really overwhelming Look, listening to all of those needs. And I feel like if we don't pass a bond, then what? You know, what's, what's the backup plan? Um, and to be honest, it kind of depresses me thinking this is where I spend all my days and all of these things and all of these, you know, uh, leaks and all this. It's it's a little overwhelming. But um, I, I do think that we've got a lot of great ideas. I think that there's a lot of great conversations that can happen. Um, I'm not interested in doing this for this summer. It's been a really hard year, but I, I know Colin would. Um, I would more than willing, you know, to uh, step back and let a smaller committee meet in the summer. But um, I think I'll tap out for a month or two um, and try to recover from this year. But um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's great. That's that's really good feedback, Aaron, and um, really appreciate that. Just so maybe a maybe I can offer a small um, thought previous to kind of that exercise, you know, that might get us really flowing on that 20 year plan is um, 
kind of at a high level and it needs refinement, you know, like we're still bracketing it, but, and thinking about it, but if we can get together as a group and break off into small groups, that's how it would work. Um, but it would, you know, it'd be pretty simple. There'd be columns and matrices associated with, okay, you know, this is a, a, you know, a total replacement. This is, you know, a modernization. This is, you know, maybe a com combination of, you know, facilities, you know, type thing and, and, you know, and minor upgrades. And, you know, we're looking at, you know, flashcards for each individual site and kind of interactively placing them and, and talking about it as small groups and then coming back together to really, you know, think about that. Because, I mean, I, I'm with you, Aaron. I, if, if the group is really serious and, the, and this district's really serious about pursuing a larger bond, you know, that's a significantly larger bond, it's probably not just repairs. It's probably some level of, you know, some classroom replacement or maybe a new school or, or something. So anyways, um, if I could offer my takeaway, <laughs> that, that would be my takeaway on that, on that level. But um, Tom, what are your thoughts on 20 year plan? I am a big fan of being able to look at the big picture and um, we have, I feel like everybody's in agreement, middle school has to be addressed and I, I think that's a done decision. Um, but, you know, I just was looking at kind of a history of kind of what's happened over the last hundred years and I, I think about how many of the buildings in this district actually are still serving, yet how different our technology is. And um, I think really addressing uh, what a building needs to have to move forward. Um, you know, a building that could be modified without having to just add a wing here kind of willy nilly and, uh, you know, something that'll be solid and is plastic or pliable um, and I feel like having um, that considering that and really looking at from the mile high view is essential um, I, I think we need to do that actually as part of the planning for the middle school but also for the whole district I mean they're, they're not independent uh, processes getting getting a structure for the middle school that's highly functional is a number one priority. Um, I think having somebody local be part of the leadership of this group um, would be valuable just sort of to help um, have someone to be a go-to as well. Um, and also somebody who is going to, you know, be a member of the, part of the community and be able to be able to see what is going to impact the community and uh, be able to take ownership for where the, the, the um, decisions go and having a way of, uh, so if, and if we had a voting process where we could actually have the information ahead of time and then weigh in and be able to have a robust conversation before we vote on kind of which direction we want to push the, the group, the meeting or the committee. Um, I think that all ties together to get a better outcome in the end. Perfect. Thank you, Tom. Um, Colin. Um, one thing that pops into my head first off is I think Brett was talking earlier about standardization with efficiency and all those. And to me, that comes back to, and we've talked a lot about the consolidation and asking what they want versus telling them, but I kind of want to go to the idea of why don't we sell it to them? Like do the research, figure out that putting those new systems in three buildings is not as efficient as putting it in one building. And if we can do the research on that and figure out all the stuff that comes in the background, when you go to talk to them about it, rather than I mean, my gut feeling is if you ask them all, they're all going to say no to begin with, right? But if you have the idea in place, 
and throw out the ideas that come out of it as you're talking about it, there's a lot way better chance that the buy-in is going to happen and that they're going to buy into it because it's the, the, the idea of change is scary, right? I mean, it's scary to people, but if you have that all figured out and talk about it beforehand. So I like the idea of the survey and, and answering, answering the question or asking the questions, but I think we should do a lot more research and thinking beforehand going into it. Um, I mean, all sorts of ideas of, you know, piece of property size, like potential size of the building. You know, one of the things I think we need to look at is what fits the needs of the people that are actually live in our district? Or are we just going to keep taking Salem Kaiser transfers to fill up the buildings? But if we're going to go build a building for us, maybe we need to stop doing that. So it's a smaller building that fits our needs. You know, things like that all need to be discussed. Um, and then I would also reiterate too that if uh, if we could meet in person in May, I would be all for it. Um, I get my next jab tomorrow, so I'll be fully vaccinated by then, but I think it would be great if we can meet in person in May. Great, thanks, Colin. Uh, Brandon. Uh, so for the 20 year plan, my, my biggest fear for this district has always been with bonds at least is that like let's say we went bigger and did priority three for everything it just seems like the pattern would be new school in town kind of sort of remodel everything out in the country and then in 20 years kind of do it again because I don't think you're ever going to get a new building out of town without building one in town. And I think in, in like those, in those years between when like you pass a big bond, you might have a small school fall by the wayside, like a monitor where it's putting stress now on Butte Creek. So I think it's, I think it's pretty important that we at least try discuss that building that kind of is looming in all of our discussions. I think that that's important to have, at least have that talk. And because I, and also I don't think anybody, anybody who is in favor of something like that and, and me is we, we want the, the country communities. Those are, those are important to Silverton. And without doing something besides new roofs and new siding every 15 years, I think eventually they're going to go away. Um, maybe I'm wrong. And, and I don't want to, like Aaron said, I don't want to tell everybody what they need out there. But I do want to have a realistic conversation about what the future holds for that. So that's kind of the biggest thing weighing on my mind would be that. And as far as the bond, it's, I've only voted on one bond in Silverton, but it seems like the ones that haven't gone well, transparency seems to be a big factor and people feeling like they weren't given all the information. So I think if you're honest and excited about it, and you don't have all these bells and whistles, but it's about the kids getting a better building and a better education. I think Silverton would go for something like that. But, so that's what I got. Great. Thanks for that perspective, Brandon. Uh, Lisa. Well, there was definitely lots of numbers, lots to think about, especially a 20 year plan. Um, we know we need a middle school. Um, I definitely think we need some ADA upgrades. I know Victor Point definitely isn't, like Josh said, we're not up there at all. And we could have potential for kids like that. Um, the current environment with COVID, I'm not sure we wanna push anything too quick. I would say we'd use this time to plan and plan how we're going to tackle the next 20 years. Um, 
I think, you know, when we talk about consolidation of some of these country schools, I think communication is key and not just, you know, calling somebody and saying, hey, would you like a new school or should we, you know, do you care if we shut your school down? I mean, people are going to go, no, you know, like, but if you get out some information, you know, like throw in the facts, like here's what it costs to keep your building up for the next 50 years, whatever. Um, let them decide, like, is this worth it? Do I want more extracurriculars? What, what do we want? Can we live with working with Pratham and Evergreen and Central Health? Could we all work together? I mean, I think, it, I think they could. They're, a, I mean, to me, they're kind of all one community. Um, that's kind of my thought. I just don't know right now, this year with COVID, it's the time. Gotcha. <clears throat> Thank you, Lisa. Um, Peter. Um, yeah, I want to start off uh, by thanking Lauren for putting all that information together. Um, it's, it, when you start looking at it um, in the condensed form, it, it still looks uh, just as bad as when you have the, the full version, but uh, at least it's a lot more digestible. Um, the long range plan, I guess, you know, going over all the, the details of the individual schools, I, that was good, but I, I think that's now where the long range plan needs to take over because until we come up with a long range plan, it's, it's not necessarily financially responsible to be putting in uh, millions of dollars um, to a school that may be on a, a transition or, or some um, consolidation. I don't really like the word consolidation because I think we're not really, we're replacing the schools. Um, but anyways, um, I think we need to have that discussion because it, it really would outline how much money and funds and, and where the priorities go uh, in the next maybe five or 10 year cycle. Because the one thing that these don't address, which I was kind of looking through is, is the capacity in town um, in 20 years, what's that gonna look like? So if we pass a large bond and do a lot of fixing, um, repairs that are definitely needed, the ADA, uh, there's a lot of needs, but uh, how are we going to address that if we do a larger bond to really, I mean, I looked at priority one, two, and three is, is they really all need to be done. Um, how are we gonna address uh, the capacity issue? Cause I didn't see a lot with any of those proposals about capacity. So it, it is concerning that that's that we're kicking the can in a way, but that's why the long range plan is so critical because we need to come up with those options, discuss them with the community. Um, we'd like to know uh, the community, we talked about the school, but I'd also like to see what uh, that school's population is drawn from within the district, uh, as well as from outside the district. Uh, then that might also give us an idea of, of where that, that uh, community uh, extends to and how far it reaches from just a physical location to its student population. So I think there's just a lot of questions that I still think we need some data for. When I see things like a $340,000 uh, locker room conversion, I know it's already been somewhat converted. I mean, that's not long range. That's, that's concerning to me. I, I'm assuming that there's going to be some access out the back of those two uh, locker rooms, but it just it doesn't seem like that's really a 20 year solution. So I think that's where we really need to focus this summer. A subcommittee would be great to, to do find maybe some leadership in this committee that would be willing to facilitate those meetings. Um, I get approval to have you know, small breakout or work sessions so we can, we can meet independently a little bit, um, not in having any quorums. Maybe that's, that wouldn't make it an issue. And then um, come back and, and like I was saying earlier, that unity uh, uniting us back together with our kind of different ideas to, to brainstorm, I think would be a lot more effective, uh, especially definitely not taking a pause over the summer, but, but just working through and really tying down a long range plan. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at with it. But, but great, great list, Lauren, and thank you again. Great. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Alan. Yeah, uh, a couple things. Um, I don't know if it was Liza or someone brought up about when you looked at the priority list, it seemed like on some of our earlier ones, we had one for extra parking. I think it was Central Howell and Scotts Mills and maybe one other one that had some issues with kids safety on parking or driveways. 
and also covered areas on a couple of them that I didn't see on the priority lists, which was interesting. But my other question to that is, so we made these priority lists and uh, congratulate Lauren for going through that because it's got to be hard to figure all that out. But um, if we really aren't going to do a bond till I believe it was brought up, what, 2023, then how many things on that priority list are going to be addressed with general fund or grants between now and then that would change that number as far as what we're going to use out of a bond for that 15 percent so that would be my question of how we need to figure that out because i would hope some of that is addressed before waiting two more years um, like some of the heating and the water issues he had the other question i had was our comment uh aaron Cook brought up the if you had a house of three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars and at the 320 that I, unless I misunderstood, I thought he said that was $300, but that should be a thousand dollars or a little bit more for that household. So we got to consider what that average is on that. If I'm doing my math correctly. Um, and I just think we need to look at this, like you say, a 20 year plan. Uh, that's a large, that's a long ways out there to choose when you look at what Lauren's short list of priorities are that if you did get all those fixed in the next five years, what are the huge issues coming up with some of these schools that aren't on a short list, but on the long list coming up in say 10 or 12 years at some of these schools. So that would be my concern in a 20 year plan. So other than that, I thought it was a great meeting tonight. Great, thank you, Alan. Uh, Lori. Yes, um, it's been a very good meeting. I just want to thank Lauren Stanley for his efforts um, and all the detailed information that he shared. Also, um, for Debbie Valoff, as well as her commitment and work with this committee. I just want to say that I heard many wonderful ideas. I, I truly do believe I, I have a list in front of me. Um, I think a survey is a wonderful way to kind of harness uh, what the community wants to see. I also am a big believer in not letting up. I, I really am with uh, Peter Matska on that. I think we should uh, move forward, even if it is with subcommittees, um, working on ideas to bring back to the whole. Um, I'm also thinking that we need to talk about where we're at, as Mr. Stanley has mentioned, that five-year plan, what does that look like and how does that sort of dovetail into the 10-year plan and so on and so on. Because as, as we think ahead um, 20 years, uh, so many things can change and fluctuate. And I think this committee certainly has the energy and uh, certainly the interest and the ability to look very closely at creating a plan that locks in step with each other, almost like ladder steps, if you will, if you're climbing up a ladder, you know, taking, because we have so many things that are in much uh, need of care. So I personally think we should keep the energy flowing and the ideas flowing and making sure that our plan comes together nicely. Um, 5, 10, 15, 20. And I uh, really believe that we just need that community input and how they're feeling right now where everything is at. So thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thank you, Lori. You bet. Wally. Yeah. Um... One thing early on in the meeting, we were talking about the uh, bonds and it was mentioned the possibility of a 30 year bond to keep the cost down. That scares me to death. Um, a a long-term bond like that would really tie the uh, district's hands for things that uh, are kind of unforeseen right now because we'll have that debt load that, that the taxpayers will already be paying for. So we need to be careful on the length of any bond that we go out for. Um, also, the survey for the community, I think it's going to be really important. We can find out uh, what 
what the community would support. Questions can be asked in such a way that uh, um, we can find out where the soft points are and, and what may or may not be palatable for the, for the community. Rather than just asking, would you, would you support this? There's other questions. A, a, good, a good firm that, that develops surveys can develop questions that can really dig in and, and get, get the information that we really need to, to set a direction that might tend, turn out to be successful. Then also, I just want to remind everybody, we talk about these five, 10, 20 year plans and building stuff. And possibly I've heard some comments about not uh, putting money into schools that, that may go away at some point. I need to remind everybody that uh, Eugene Field, 1964, the, the board at that time said, we're gonna get rid of this school. And the district continued using that school for another 50 years. So we need to be careful when we start talking about that. That's all. Great, thank you, Wally. Scott, I will end on you if you want to say anything. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't have a whole lot uh, else to add, and it's just been great to listen. But I, what I'm hearing the most, of course, is the concept of a survey. It started with Melissa, and then, you know, Wally, you kind of crystallized all of it for me, at least. And, and I, I do feel that there's a, a process we can set up, uh, working with a third party to make sure that we're addressing. Uh, survey to gather the most information. My, my main hope for the Silver Falls community is that that survey, um, the, the people uh, in the group developing that survey is heavily represented with our folks from our K-8 school communities. To me, that is just uh, critical. Um, and, and that's my main hope. I think that because I think we'll be then be able to sell the survey better and not also i think that it will mean more to folks in the in the k-8 school communities that we had a large representation of that perspective as well um <clears throat> and um you know I'll, I'll get back to the the committee on you know what a subcommittee would look like to me what it feels more like is a superintendent's work group uh, with subcommittees and everything else, we've gotten uh, some pretty strong advice from OSBA um, around break up group, breakout groups, subcommittees, that type of thing. And, and I'll need to double check on that. But, but what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of interest in working through the summer uh, in a smaller setting, perhaps, and developing a way to capture the thoughts and feelings and perspectives of our folks um, in our K-8 school communities. So um, thank you for that. <clears throat> Absolutely. Thanks, Scott. Um, so I think that's, um, that's it for tonight. Um, we were thinking the next meeting, May 19th, does that work for everybody? And I appreciate everybody staying long. I know we went over our time tonight, but this is really important work. Um, so thank you so much. Good night.